worked at Six Flags last spring slash summer. Well, technically a freelance arts company leasing vending spots there. I was one of the oldest people hired, being 18 at the time. I just started attending college, while most of my other co-workers were still in high school. I took photos in a sort of old-timey dress-up shop. It was honestly one of the most fun jobs I've ever had. I was hired back in March of 2018 and started work in April. This was when the park was open on weekends only, before the official opening. I had been working for about a month, and the park was now open during the week as well, for less than 10 hours per day. I was able to work all day long pretty much, but was unfortunately the only one in the shop, as college was on summer break, and high school was still in session until mid-June. I'm sure you can tell where this story is going. I was alone all day during the weekdays, and only had co-workers on the weekends. I was so terribly alone during the day that I'd just walk across the path and watch my other co-workers doing things out of boredom. When I was outside of my shop area during the day, I began to notice that a man had started hanging around my area. I'd mainly see him walking by very slowly and staring at me, not blinking the entire time. I figured he was just a shy guy that wanted a picture inside and was too afraid or socially awkward to come in and speak to me. Deep down, he did give me an uneasy feeling, but I decided to ignore it. He was a customer in the park and so far he hadn't really done anything to me. I kept a smile and tried pulling in more customers all day every day. One day, I smiled and waved at him. That was probably my big mistake. He walked over briskly to stand in front of me and just kind of stared at me. I was creeped out and kind of scared of this guy, honestly. After like a full minute of just staring into my soul, he asked about the prices. After days of walking by and staring at me, I breathed a sigh of relief and started going through my memorized sales pitch. After I finished, he started to smile. It was not a normal smile, though. It was the kind that makes your skin crawl. He leaned in so close to my face that I could smell his breath. He asked how much it would be for him. I was confused as I'd just gone through my price list, so I stated that the prices were set and non-negotiable unless you were an art company employee or a park employee. He shrugged and just walked off. As I ran through my pitch to others during the day, a family had grown interested and wanted to take some pictures. I gladly took them into the shop and had a wonderful time photographing them. While I was checking the family out and collecting their payment, I looked up and saw the man was back. He was leaning against the chain barrier in front of my shop. The family collected their things and walked over to the chain. The man had to move to the sign for me to open it for them. I immediately closed it behind them as he tried pushing his way inside. I told him I was sorry, but only paying customers could come in. He wasn't allowed to do so unless he was considering a purchase. He frowned and walked away. I waited a few minutes, tidied everything up, and stepped back outside to continue working. It was almost closing time, so it was kind of pointless but I had to stand outside and try to get more customers anyway, or else I'd get in trouble with my boss. I noticed the man one additional time that day. Across the way from me was a kind of carnival game or something. I could see him hiding behind it, peeking his head out and looking at me. I can't tell you just how eerie that sight was. He continued to do all of this for the entire week, and eventually I just learned to ignore him which apparently he did not really like. On that Friday, as soon as the park opened, he startled me by making a beeline towards me. I was out front organizing outdoor props, and I froze. I hastily dropped what I was doing and went back inside, closing the chain behind me. The man paced back and forth in front of the store, muttering to himself and looking at me. I was so terrified, I was going to run to the phone and call security. He suddenly lurched forward, grabbing the chain in both of his hands. I'll never forget this moment. His eyes were completely wild, and he had that same menacing grin. 
He started whispering about the things he wanted to do to me. It was disgusting. He started ranting about how much he loved me, and we were meant to be together. How he wanted me to put him in a dress and humiliate him in front of all the people in the park. I was slowly backing up to the wall in my shop as he started laughing and yelling hysterically. I told him to go away and that I was going to call security. He got even more angry and said something that still keeps me up at night to this day. Even if you do, I'll be waiting for you when you get out. Meet me by the employee exit on your way, or else. He gave me that same disgusting smile and walked away. I went behind the counter and tried to compose myself. I never imagined I'd have something like this happen to me, let alone at work. Now that I had, all my knowledge of what to do went out the window, and I started crying like a little girl. I decided to tell my manager at the end of the day, because I didn't want to be afraid of coming into work. When I told him, he was completely mortified that I hadn't told him sooner. He walked me to a secret exit of the employee parking lot, so I wouldn't have to deal with the man. The next morning, we went to the security office, and I gave a description to all of the park security of what he looked like and what he would normally wear. I went back to my shop with two co-workers. Not even five minutes later, there he came strolling over with an angry look on his face. I hadn't ran into him last night, and he was furious. My co-workers noticed my panic as I ran and hid in the back. I hadn't told them about my situation yet. And when I did, they told me they would not leave me alone even after their shift was over, so the guy couldn't get to me. I called security and told them what he was wearing, so they updated the information. They posted an officer outside my shop as well. The man seemed to disappear because of that. When the officer had to leave to take care of something for a moment though, he immediately came back. Security realized that every time a clothed officer was around, he would hide away. So instead, they posted a plainclothes officer across from my shop, posing as a customer. I was being used as bait ultimately, but I felt it was important to get a guy like this out of the park. Security eventually apprehended him later that day, as he was heading towards my shop again. They asked me for identification on him, and I remember breaking down and sobbing. The officer comforted me. Finally, the nightmare was over. He never physically threatened me or wielded a weapon, I guess, but he was doing enough verbal threats to make me fear for my life. They banned him from all six flag parks in the country, revoked his membership status, and took him into custody as well. Unfortunately, as there was no violent acts committed, they had to let him go. As I drove home that night, I saw him walking on the side of the road. I immediately sped away, in fear he would see me through the window and try to do something to me. At least he couldn't get to me at work anymore. I found a couple of weeks later from one of my security friends that he saw my stalker being arrested in a town over. I went and looked up the public arrest records for that town later that day and saw he'd been arrested for indecent exposure, public endangerment, and public intoxication. I know what happened to me might not be as severe as some other stories, but it was one of the most terrifying weeks in my life. You really don't think something like this will happen to you until it does. I'm a woman and I'm now 23. This happened around the time that I was 15 years old. I've had a couple of encounters that have been very creepy, but this one had me shaken to my very core. Around this time, it was my sophomore year of high school. A little backstory to understand the story I'm about to tell. At the time, I was kind of going through a phase, as most teenagers tend to do. I wore short shorts most of the time and fishnets as well. My shirts weren't really tops that a 15-year-old should wear, I think, but, you know, we still do. I cringe at my outfits back then and my makeup, but that was just how it was. I was involved with my high school color guard. We're a part of the band, except we don't play instruments. Instead, we spin colorful flags. We also used rifles and sabers in our performances. 
Around this time, it was the fall, and we were practicing our show. We were doing a lot of reruns to try and perfect it before the usual competitions would start. Normally, practice would start at 4 and end at almost 9. Side note, I did not live close to my high school like most people that went there. The drive would take at least 15 minutes. Walking from my house to school would take about an hour, and taking the bus would take 45 minutes. My brother at this time worked late hours, and my parents didn't get off work until midnight. My next best choice was to take the bus home. The neighborhood was not the worst, but it wasn't safe enough to be walking home alone at night. Even before this night, I had always been a little bit on edge going home. On this particular night, I was saying goodbye to my friends and not wanting to bug them for a ride, so I walked over to my bus stop. I had my cell phone out and was scrolling through Facebook. I would occasionally glance up and check out my surroundings when I noticed a car slowing down in front of the bus stop. It immediately signaled to make a turn to my left. I didn't really think that much about it, since there are houses behind that area. It wasn't that weird, until I noticed this car doing that again and again and again. I get scared easily and am already a paranoid enough person, so this had my alarm bells ringing right away. It wasn't until he had basically passed me by for the seventh time in a row that he parked on the curb by the bus stop. That's when I got a better look at him and took in his appearance. This happened a couple of years ago, so my memory is not perfect. I do remember he seemed to be Hispanic and reminded me a bit of an uncle of a friend of mine. His first words sent me panicking. To translate what he said to me in Spanish, it was basically him saying, Hey, come over here. Do you need a ride? Hop in, I'll take ya. He kept saying that for five minutes like a robot, then just drove off. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding in. I was trying to calm myself down and tell myself that that was it. But I knew it wouldn't be, and I was unfortunately right. His car showed back up not long later. The thing about my bus stop is that there's a bunch of houses right behind it. Before the houses is a good amount of space with only dirt. Cars can actually go in this area, and I've seen it before. For some reason, it shocked me to see him drive around the back and park right behind me. At this point, I was panicking, and tears were falling down my cheeks. I was already thinking I'd never see my family again, because this man was surely going to try and take me. I was frozen in place. I already knew that in crucial moments like this, my reaction is to freeze, not fight or flight. Freezing is what I do. I still believe it was the prayers I was saying that saved me. At the exact same time the man began to approach me, these two big bulky guys walked close by. They appeared to be walking their pit bull on a leash. I'm a sucker for dogs, but at this time I couldn't speak or say anything. I was still in my frozen state. I knew this was my only chance, and I fought to get those words out. They kept catching in my throat. It was my only chance to save myself, so I spoke out in a shaky voice. Excuse me, please, can you guys stay with me? That man over there won't leave me alone. I'm very scared. My words were choked up and I was shaking at this point. The guys were very kind-hearted, thankfully, and agreed to stay by my side. To come off as more intimidating, they even crossed their arms across their chest and flexed their muscles. They stared down the man, who at this point got back into his car and began reversing. He drove off and the guys stayed with me until my bus arrived. The time when this all ended was 9.59. I know some of you might be asking, why didn't you just go back to your high school? Well, at this point in night, no one would really be there. Mostly everyone else had already gone home. I did have a cell phone, but no one was going to be able to pick me up. The bus was my only transportation at that time, and I didn't know that Lyft or Uber existed. Actually, I'm not even sure it was a thing back then. Overall, I'm just happy to have been saved that day by the kind-hearted men. 
I hope one day I can see those guys that stayed with me and thank them for what they did. Because of them, I'm still here and able to share this story of mine. I'm still shaken up at the memory because of the scare it gave me. After that incident, I asked for a ride for the remainder of that season. Sometimes, even when you don't want to bug people with things, it doesn't really hurt to ask. It's better to be slightly annoying than to find yourself in a bad situation. You can always apologize to your friends, but you can't come back if something bad happens to you. This happened a few months ago in the beginning of summer. I've held off on sharing it for so long because I didn't want to be judged for my actions. I joined a stupid online dating app. I divorced just last winter. I was kind of living it up, you know. I somehow matched with this man who lived in New York, an eight-hour drive away from me. After texting for a few weeks, he sprung it on me that he was going to drive down to see me. Since I'd been staying with my family ever since the divorce, I decided we'd get a hotel. He told me to find one and he'd pay for it. I already felt super bad that he was driving so far, so I was trying to find good deals and the cheapest place that wasn't sketchy as fuck. I live about 40 minutes outside of the city in the state that I live in, and I'm not super familiar with some areas. The hotel I booked ended up being no bueno, but I didn't know this until I got there. It was dark by the time I arrived after getting lost four times. There was a very shady motel across the street, with two men smoking cigarettes on the porch. Lots of trucks and truckers traveling through too. I was walking into this hotel thinking, well shit, I fucked up. I just went with it anyway though, because I didn't really have a choice. And why, what we'll refer to the man as, was about an hour away, so he'd be there pretty soon. The hotel was run by Jamaicans, I think a whole family. This comes into play later, which is why I mention it. The woman who checked me in was fairly nice, but the whole place just gave off some weird vibes. The lighting, the heavy smell of bleach, the strange carpet, I don't know. It was really bright but also really dark, if that makes any sense. I started shaking as I was trying to check in. The reservation was under NY's name. At first, she told me she couldn't find it. His last name was Spanish, so I thought maybe I was pronouncing it wrong, even though I'm pretty good with my Spanish. This made it awkward, because now she knew I was meeting a stranger. I thought maybe he gave you the wrong name, she had said. I nervously chuckled. She put me on the second floor. I was expecting an elevator, but as I turned, I saw that behind me was a huge carpeted staircase. I get to my room and just pace around, waiting for this stranger from the internet to show up. It started raining. I was sitting by the window, sipping a glass of wine. When I see a pickup truck pull up, I think maybe it's him. A man in a black hoodie gets out and locks his truck, about 50 beep beeps or so, then runs inside. I started panicking, thinking it was him. He had no bags or luggage. Maybe he was just coming to kidnap me or something. There was a loud knock at the door. I jumped hard and immediately stood up. I made my way over to the door and looked through the peephole. It was NY. No black hoodie, carrying all his bags with him. I cracked the door and smiled. He came in and I shared my terrifying thoughts with him. We chuckled and had a laugh together. Sex happens, of course. Later that night, we were falling asleep. He was spooning me, but also had his arms all the way around me, with his head on top of my head. I was awoken from a dead sleep, sweaty because he was holding me so tightly. I thought that was what had woken me up, but then I heard it. Someone was fucking with our door. I heard the handle moving, as whoever it was tried to open it, but it refused to budge. NY jumped out of bed so fast, I wondered how long he'd been awake, listening to this to react so quickly. I pulled the covers up to my chin, as he was standing in the dark in his undies looking at the door. He looked through the peephole, and said he thought it was one of those Jamaican men who worked there. 
We had a chain on the door, as well as the locks, so he kept the chain on and opened it a few inches. Before he could even ask what the man wanted, the guy just called out, Is the white girl in there? I remember getting chills all over my body. NY said no and slammed the door in his face, almost completely unbothered by this. The man said something about needing a credit card from me. NY yelled back that the room was on his card under his name, and he'd take care of it in the morning. I looked over at the clock and it was 2 a.m. I turned over and stared at the wall, hoping to fall back asleep. NY wrapped his arms around me again and immediately started snoring in my ear. Good thing he was hot. The next morning, we decided to get some breakfast. It was super early, and we were both feeling groggy from last night. I'm hoping that as we round the corner to the stairs that no one is at the front desk. They definitely heard the noises from our room, and I was feeling really embarrassed. And that was when I saw him. An older black male, standing a few feet from the exit. Honestly, I don't know if he was Jamaican or if he was part of the family who owned this place, or a guest or just someone else. I don't know. His face was sunken in, and he had a weird chilling look in his eyes. He was staring right at me. I knew, without even seeing him last night, that this must have been the same guy. And why whispered for me to just keep walking, so I broke eye contact with him and leaned into NY as we made our way towards the exit. As we passed by, the man was silent. Then, as I'm pushing the door open to exit the building, he suddenly calls out, There's the white girl. I found the white girl. She makes a lot of noise. NY snorted, but I was terrified. I left for work after breakfast. I was gone a few hours and returned to the hotel to find the room empty. I texted NY and asked where he was. He texted back saying he was in the laundry room and he'd be right back up. I sat down on the bed waiting for him. I heard some footsteps outside the door, the floor creaking, like someone was standing out front shifting their weight back and forth. I figured maybe NY forgot his room key, so I got up to look through the peephole, only to see it was not him. The creepy man from before was standing outside the door, just staring in through the peephole. I jumped back and started crying. I called NY and yelled for him to come to the room quickly, because the man was outside the door again. He was gone by the time NY arrived. He went down to the front desk and spoke to the woman about this man. She just kept saying she had no idea who he was talking about, and that she would keep an eye out for him. That night, obviously I had a hard time sleeping. I felt like I could feel him lingering around outside the door, but I was too scared to go and look to check. And why was of course sleeping soundly. He was still a stranger, but he was the most comforting thing I had. We checked out the next morning. I grabbed his hand as we made our way down the stairs, because guess who was standing right there? Yeah, the woman from the front desk was now gone, replaced by a younger male. The creepy man was smiling as we neared the bottom of the stairs, his awful, bone-chilling grin. Lucky man with a white girl, was the last comment we heard from this creep. NY spun around and told him to fuck off, then walked me out to my car. He waited while I drove off to make sure no one followed me. I don't know, maybe there's more we could have done. But again, the guy didn't actually do anything technically. It was just a very unnerving experience. About a month later, I was telling my dad about it. He laughed and told me I had picked the worst part of the city. He thought he'd heard about this place being shut down multiple times for either drugs or sex trafficking. I work overnights at a 24-hour diner. You can probably guess what company. I'm used to weird people and odd things happening, but tonight was just too much. The restaurant backs up to a field that has a tree line, and my cook and I would go out back to smoke sometimes. We could hear someone yelling in the distance tonight, but we get a lot of homeless people that come through town that are usually harmless, so we shrugged it off as sort of weird and went back inside. Later on, I came out again to smoke, 
and throw away some trash in the dumpster that was next to the field. He might think it was stupid to go over to it, but I hadn't heard any sounds out there again. As I was walking away from the dumpster, though, I suddenly heard someone call out to me. Hey, you! Come here! Hey, come here! It was clearly the same person, but much closer than when we had heard him yelling the first time. I went inside and got my co-worker, who owned a car with a spotlight on it. We shined it out into the field, which again was not that smart. We'll admit that, but we couldn't see where this guy was. I could still hear him though. Hey girl, come here! I called the cops at this point. This was just too weird to be dealing with on my own. As soon as I got off the phone with them, a man came walking out of the field. He was an older man, wearing a tan trench coat. My co-worker and a customer ran back inside because this dude was hauling ass across the parking lot. He started to come towards the door, and I called the cops again. My cook cut him off and told him he needed to go right now. The man was now acting incredibly erratically, running around and yelling at my cook. All of a sudden, he stopped and said, I'll end your life the next time I see you, you fucker. He kept moving his jacket by his waist like he was flashing a weapon or something, but we couldn't really see anything from inside. The cops caught him down the road. An officer came by and basically said the guy was homeless and not mentally stable. Wow, what a surprise. We told them everything that happened, and my cook tried to press charges on him for threatening him. The officers told us there wasn't anything they could do, though. He wouldn't give her his name, so they just let him go. Basically, it all ended with, Oh, by the way, he's known to carry a knife in his waistband. Call us if you need us. Bye! He came back, again hauling ass across the neighboring parking lot and back into the field. We could hear him screaming all the while, saying, Hey, come here! Again and again. We got busy when the bar closed, and I hadn't heard him yelling ever since. I know he's still hiding back there, though, because I occasionally catch glimpses of him or see him emerging from the field slightly. My manager comes in the morning, and I'm going to try and get her to let me take a picture of him off the security tapes so I can warn the other third shift workers. The field that he's camping out in also backs up to a middle school, but the cops said again there was nothing they could do. Hopefully he moves on and leaves us alone, or the cops can get him on something before anybody gets hurt. My sister and I were having a prank war for about a week straight. Well, we agreed to a ceasefire, since my birthday was only two days away. I had just turned 11, and later that very same night, I began to hear my closet door open. Oh, so my sister wanted to prank me on my special day, eh? I'll show her, I thought. I knew she must have snuck in and forgot that my door squeaks, so I had an idea. I would get up and push her. Ah, I'm a genius, kiddo. Slowly I got up, and she began to step out of the closet only for me to realize this was not my sister. My sister didn't have long black hair or scars on her face and wasn't as tall as a grown woman either. I went to scream, but instead I just froze and silently started whimpering and crying. The woman knelt down to me and brushed my hair out of my face, then put her finger to her lips and let out a soft shh. She then opened my window and crawled outside, slowly closed it, and was never seen again. At first, I thought the woman was a ghost or something. But after telling my parents, I became convinced that someone snuck into my room through my window that night. This story happened about a year and a half ago now when I was around 19 years old. It will always stay with me, as it's definitely given me PTSD and a great fear of men since it happened. I had just moved into a college apartment with friends, 
only finding out a few months later that there was improper ventilation. That led to excess humidity and mold in the bathrooms and other spaces. Maintenance and management would proceed to label it as discoloration and say to just leave the windows open or buy a fan and stop taking steamy showers. This advice was given after this event and ignoring my reports I made to law enforcement and the main landlord. However, we were barely adults and had never had to deal with such a terrible mold issue. Buying sprays, cleaning the ceilings in all crevices, the corners of the tub, constantly in fear of mold inhalation. We found this cleaning regimen and leaving our window open with the mosquito screen locked helped the most to air out the place. This small window, about the size of an average human head and about nine feet off the ground, was no concern to us when we were using the bathroom. After all, we'd even walked around outside and checked ourselves to make sure no one could easily look or get in. Of course, I never could have predicted what would come next. On our front porch, we had some pumpkins and a single white chair that was barely used. This will become important later. One night, after airing out the humid bathroom after a shower like normal, I wished my roommate good night around 2 a.m. before going to use the toilet. I was wearing the baggiest shirt ever at the time, so thankfully nothing was exposed while doing so. I nonchalantly flushed and went to wash my hands when I happened to glance to the left, where the window was ajar as usual, and that's when I saw it. In the pitch black of night, in contrast to the blaring and cheap bathroom lights, there was a pale round orb with a mop of dark hair atop it, obviously someone's head. I can't explain to you the feeling I had in that moment. It was almost like when someone is whispering to you just audibly enough to where you need a second or two to register what they're actually saying. After that pause, I did a double take, only to see a white arm now leaning into the mosquito screen for support, before whisking away and down out of frame. Without another thought, I found myself running for the front door, screaming, Someone was looking into the bathroom! I was yelling over and over to my roommate in the living area. On a side note, do not ever chase after a perp, no matter what the cause is even if it's hard with adrenaline running through you in those cases. I heard her yelling back while I found myself already at the bottom of the window outside. I could hear scuffling through the wood chips outside our apartment building. It was clearly the sound of someone swiftly escaping. There was no mistaking it. I couldn't see anyone through the shitty trees that were planted all around though, and stopped as I couldn't pinpoint exactly where he'd gone to. I thought about yelling some cheap insult or threat to scare him, but I found myself feeling waves of shock silence me. I ran past my roommate, grabbed my phone from inside, and called my mother, who advised me to call the non-emergency number in my town. I did so while sitting on the patio with my self-defense items and my roommate. The lady that answered was clearly annoyed and sounded like she didn't even believe me, no matter what I said all because I didn't get a good look at him. She sighed, then said the police would be over to survey the complex shortly, then hung up on me. My roommate and I were in shock, just sitting there in silence. We discussed in detail what just happened when we saw a cop car driving around the complex one block away. They immediately drove off after one minute of lingering. Obviously, this left me feeling a bit more defeated than before. I got angry, stood up, and examined the area outside my window myself. I saw no footprints or markings that were unnatural. I even tried standing on the electric boxes outside to see if I could get a look like the guy was. Not only were the boxes too narrow for someone any bigger than myself, as I have a small shoe size compared to the average guy, but this would only allow for a view of half the ceiling for a second or two before falling off altogether. Obviously, that's not how he was looking in. I knew from the way he had struggled to get down. I saw enough of his torso to determine he must be around 5 foot 8, and had to have some other way to be easily staring in like that. 
It was also odd that he had somehow managed to dart off without me actually seeing him and only really hearing him because there are sensors placed all around the complex and one right outside our bathroom window. When triggered, they display a bright and blinding light that lights up the whole back area and side of our apartment where this occurred. I brainstormed for a second before trying to trigger it. It didn't go off. When I walked back to my roommate, that's when it did. I tested this twice over, and the same results. It only worked if you were moving slowly past it. Oddly enough, I felt a sense of relief. If only for the fact that I was clearly not crazy. I was the only witness to this, but I could tell my roommate believed me. We headed back to our front door, talking about what we would do if the guy came back. Obviously, we would be keeping our window closed now, but we had to give him just dessert somehow, we thought in our exhausted and overwhelmed teenage heads. And that was when I joked about grabbing one of our pumpkins and smacking him over the head with it when I stopped in my tracks. Hey, didn't we have a chair there? I asked. And the white patio chair was gone. We looked around and it was nowhere to be found. And that was how we did it. My roommate hurriedly looked through her phone. She remembered having a food order earlier that day with photo confirmation. Approximately four hours earlier, there it was, the bag at our door sitting directly on the white chair next to our pumpkins. I immediately posted to social media sites asking for help finding this distinct chair. Maybe that would help us track down this pale-faced creep. Not only had he been staring into our bathroom for God knows how long, but he had surveyed our front door area and possibly looked in through the windows there as well. Our apartment made sure to install the worst kinds of blinds you can never fully close, so if anyone wanted to look inside, all they would have to do was crouch a bit. We felt disgusted and shocked. I left three voice messages with the apartment complex the next day, informing them of the incident and the issues with their ventilation. As you can expect, no one ever got back to me, which was weird since they always did previously. I did everything I could, but we couldn't really do anything. In fact, I received tips from other college girls in the same area, telling me of very similar experiences. Recently, these past few months too, there have been numerous assaults, as well as peeping toms, in the area of our apartments. Funnily enough, their more clear descriptions match the brief glimpse I got of the man. Still, the police never caught anyone in connection with all these cases. I never viewed this area as a bad area and always took every precaution I could. I still feel a bit at fault now, though. I know I'm not, but I hope everyone living in a similar situation makes sure to at least close their shower curtains to shield yourself or close your window when the bathroom is in use at all. I wish I could afford to buy security cameras, but I know the management would file a complaint against me. I'm moving out soon, so that's really the only solace I have. Getting out of there and leaving all this behind. I used to love a good Subway sandwich. I still do, kind of, but I don't get it as often as I used to due to the rising prices. My go-to was always a six-inch untoasted Italian sub with turkey, provolone cheese, pepperoni, pickles, black olives, and salt and pepper. I changed it to a foot long when I got older. I never deviated from that formula for as long as I went to the local subway in my town. That is, until one day. Probably my last day going there for quite a while. I like to joke that it might have been a sign, but I really don't know what to believe. It was a normal Saturday afternoon. My boyfriend and I went to grab some lunch after a date at the pet store right next door. We like to stop by and look at all the reptiles specifically, and fantasize about which ones we'd get when we got our own place. Not that that's the point of this story or anything. The subway wasn't all that busy. Just us, the two employees, and two people sitting in a booth in the back corner. We were able to jump right in line. I let my boyfriend go first, and was just about to order my usual, 
when one of the other pre-established combinations caught my eye, the steak and cheese. I decided to take a chance and try it. After we paid, we went to sit down with our meal. It smelled amazing to me. My boyfriend and I were quickly lost in our conversation and our food. So much so that even the restaurant chatter faded away into the background. At one point though, I looked over and noticed the two people at the other occupied booth had both drawn their hoods over their faces and were in the middle of an intense and whispered conversation. I was facing them while my boyfriend had his back to them. While I don't normally eavesdrop on people, something about the way they were talking and glancing back at the counter kept getting my attention. My boyfriend asked what was wrong, but I said it was nothing. Suddenly, the man of the two turned and made eye contact with me. His eyes widened, and he turned to his partner. They got up from their seats in a hurry and rushed out the door. As they did so, something clattered to the floor, something the guy must have dropped. It hit the ground with a loud smack. My boyfriend went over to see what it was. It turned out to be a knife, a pretty big one at that. We immediately took it to the front counter and explained what we'd seen. The girl we talked to looked creeped out to say the least and said she wasn't sure what to think. We've speculated that the two people were gathering courage to rob the place. When the guy saw me looking at him, he must have assumed we knew what they were up to and decided to get out of there instead. We're really glad nobody got hurt, but we haven't been back to that subway shop ever since. I'm young. I mean, I'm 30, so I'm kind of young. But I saw this little girl at Walmart not too long ago, just running around in the toy aisles enjoying herself. She must have run past me four or five times. I smiled a bit, thinking about how endearing it was. But as I paid closer attention, I noticed that a man would always be right behind her, or right on her tail. For some reason, I could feel something was off here. I stopped the little girl from her frantic running and asked her if she was lost, perhaps. She said yes. I asked if the man was her daddy, and with almost tears in her eyes, she looked back at him and slowly looked back at me. Then she said she didn't know him at all. I grabbed her by the hand and told her we were going to go to the front and have them call for her mommy. The man was just standing there in the aisle. I grabbed her a little harder as we walked past him and made our way to the front of the store. As we walked right past the man, I looked him straight in the eye. He just kind of gave me this smirk that today still raises the hair on my body remembering it. Had I not stopped that little girl and brought her to the front to find her mom, I'm genuinely scared to know what that guy would have done to her. Before I begin, here's a little background on me when this happened. I was about 5 feet tall and had quite a broad figure, due to me playing rugby quite a lot. A little background on Lucas when this happened. He was about 5 foot 5 and very slim. Anyway, here's the story. In high school, there was this guy who I found extremely attractive and cute. I'll call him Lucas. At the time, I was 16. He was in a few of my classes, maybe three or four. I'd always want to talk to him and get to know him, but with me being in the closet, the massive fear of rejection and not knowing whether he was gay or not, I decided to just admire him from afar rather than try to pursue him. As time went by throughout the term though, I started to notice him staring at me more and more. In the classes we had together, at first, I was happy he'd even noticed me at all, to be honest, but it started to make me a bit uncomfortable and self-conscious. I pretended not to notice, since it would have been embarrassing for both of us if we made eye contact during him staring. Half-term came around, and I wasn't thinking much about Lucas at this point. We came back to school, and in our psychology class, we were paired up for group activities. We sat down next to each other. I didn't really know how to feel about this. 
We didn't talk for the first few lessons, but when a group activity in case study practicing came around, it was a must to do so. I started the talking, and he reacted normally. Being close to him was making my heart pound like crazy. He was exactly my type. A few lessons passed by of us conversing normally about many things, including the schoolwork. When he out of the blue asked for my number, I was pretty much in shock. I asked for what reason. He replied he was just curious. Of course, I gave it to him. By this point, I had completely forgotten about the strange staring from when he used to sit far away from me. As soon as the school hour ended, he began to text me, asking me how I was. The only thing I found somewhat strange was how immediate all his replies were, even if mine were a few minutes late. Lucas didn't have Facebook or anything on social media, and whenever I saw him around school, he was all alone reading older books. I began to raise my courage within me to ask if he was gay or not, considering the interest he was showing in me. I waited for a good opportunity to ask. After I sent that text, it was about two minutes before I got a response. I noticed this because the latest of all his other replies were only about ten seconds in between. No exaggeration. His reply was, yes, does that bother you? I decided to tell him I was too in the heat of the moment. I was truly happy that he was willing to be open about it with me, and I thought I should do the same. He replied with, oh cool. This is where things took a turn. He began to send like five or six messages in a row. They would devolve into asking where I was or whether I wanted him to go away if I didn't reply immediately. After I replied, he would go right back to being sweet and friendly. Half time came around once again, and I was ready to start hitting the parties. One night, I left for the party with my phone, but I realized I'd forgotten to plug it into the charger so it was pretty much dead. I didn't realize this until the car ride to the place. I forgot about it and drank until I became tipsy. The party was a lot of fun. It finished up and I started to walk home with some good friends for part of the journey. They had to go their own way though, and I had to follow a path through some small woods. I didn't even think about being scared, since I'd done it a million times before, even during the night. Less than halfway across the path, though, I began to hear someone whispering from a bush right beside where I needed to walk. I felt my heart clinch. I tried not to react much because I didn't want them to realize I was there. The whispering was repetitive and getting louder and louder. I was contemplating what to do. Should I turn back or try to get past without this guy noticing me? I had to make a split-second decision. I thought it would have been dumb to walk all this way and just turn back over some probably homeless and harmless man. I still attempted to walk by without them hearing me. As I was walking though, the whispering stopped and the leaves began to rustle as if someone was moving slowly around in the brush. I should have known to begin running at that point, but I was frozen in fear of the unknown. I had no idea who was hiding there. It was all too clear to me that whoever it was had noticed me. I remember the overwhelming feeling of hesitation to run, that it would cause them to lunge at me and chase after. I waited for about ten seconds after the rustling. As I stood there, a black figure rose slowly from the bushes, wearing a black hoodie, with the hood covering the moonlight from reaching their face. They had quite a short and slim build. I didn't think there would have been a problem taking them on, but they lifted their arm, revealing a kitchen knife covered in red liquid that seemed to be blood. The mere sight of this sent me into a panic. I began to sprint straight home. I looked back and saw the figure standing out in the middle of the path. Where they were stood, I could see their whole figure. When I reached home, I didn't even take a second to breathe. I woke my parents up and told them what happened. My dad called the police while I looked through the blinds in our kitchen discreetly to see if anyone was out there. The next morning, we were told nothing was found, but they would look into it more. I checked my phone since I'd been away from it for a while. I had over 200 missed messages from Lucas, exclaiming that if he couldn't have me, then no one could. 
He went on to say how he knew my route home, and he'd been waiting to show me how much he was devoted to me. I was freaking out, and decided to show these messages to my parents. They gave the information to the police. The first day back to school, I noticed he wasn't in any of his classes. That happened for the next few weeks, and no one seemed to really notice. He didn't have any friends, really. I never asked my parents what happened to him, since I was at a very difficult time. The messages were how they found out I was gay, so I didn't like to talk much about it. After asking the teachers if they knew anything, I noticed they'd all become clammy when the situation was discussed and avoided answering at all costs. I decided to just not ask anymore eventually. It seemed to make everyone uncomfortable, and to be honest, I wasn't sure if I wanted to know what happened to him. I'll never know whose blood was on that knife, or whether it was even blood at all really. I assume it must have been his own. I'm now 20 and in college. To me, it's now a distant memory. I know this might not be as bad as some stories you've heard, but to me, it was a truly terrifying part of my life. I guess you could say I'm lucky in life. I'm attractive, a young woman with long flowing blonde hair, and voluptuous for my age. In other ways, I'm unlucky though. Let me tell you how this all started. When I was a senior in a New Jersey high school, a creepy and thin kid named Gary enrolled there. Even though Gary was super thin and acted creepy and awkward, he was surprisingly strong and beat to a pulp some bullies who'd mistakenly thought he was weak. Unfortunately for me, Gary was in my gym class, and he became infatuated with me. I remember in gym, the boys all wear t-shirts and shorts, and the girls wore t-shirts and shorts as well. Being in gym class sometimes, though, I would wear spandex tights with my sneakers. That was a bad idea, apparently. This led Gary to become even more attracted to me. I remember one day I was running around the track at gym when Gary just ran up to me and said, Jamie, would you like to go out with me? He had this leering grin on his face. I politely declined him. I'm sorry, Gary, you're just not my type. I tried to say it as sweetly as possible, but it didn't go over very well. Gary grabbed my arm so hard it left a bruise. You will go out with me, he yelled at me angrily. This behavior from him frightened me, obviously. One of my girlfriends ran up to us and then whisked me out of Gary's hands. Come on, Gary, leave her alone. You heard what she said. We quickly walked away. Looking back on all this now, I probably should have called the gym teacher, the school principal, or maybe even my dad for help, but I just didn't for some reason. I guess I was probably afraid that Gary might hurt me for doing so. Later in health class, Gary slid in right next to me and started to rub his hand down my leg. I quickly brushed his hand off my lap, only for Gary to then creepily look at our teacher. You know, Miss Perilla is not nearly as built as you are, he said, adding in a Joker maniac laugh for some added flair. He tried to lay his hands on my legs again. I brushed it off once more. Great. Now I had a sick, perverted guy harassing me in class. Plus, I found out Gary's father was a police detective. A police detective with a sick, perverted son stalking the hell out of me. That stalking did not cease at just the classroom either. Things started to happen outside of school as well. Later one night, my girlfriend Donna and I took a bus to a movie we wanted to see. When we got off the bus, we noticed that Gary had followed us sneakily in his car. Donna and I paid for our movie tickets and rushed into our particular movie, hoping Gary didn't see which theater we went to. As luck would have it, he did. He sat down right next to me. Wow, Jamie, you sure are one sexy young girl. Are you sure you don't want to go out with me? He asked me for the millionth time. I just grabbed Donna's hand and rushed past him as we left the theater. There was one time my friends and I were walking down the sidewalk together, and Gary literally jumped out of a bush and grabbed me. 
I'd never been so scared in all my life. I screamed and somehow managed to get out of his grasp. I ran away with my friends. It was lucky for me Gary didn't seem to know where I lived or my cell phone number. If he did, he would have always been hounding me with calls and things like that. One of the last times Gary bothered me was when I was walking down the hallway in school. Gary grabbed my butt quite hard, making me drop my school books all over the floor. Are you absolutely sure you don't want to date me? He asked, leering at me with a wide and evil grin on his face. I picked up my books and started walking to class. He walked away doing this crazy hysterical laugh. Fortunately for me, I was a senior in high school and was going to graduate soon. I did happily and enrolled in an out-of-state college. Although I was happy, the fear of Gary never left my mind. I was hoping I would never meet the guy again, but life is never certain. Late one night, my cell phone buzzed in my college room. I woke up in bed with a startled fright. I don't usually get calls this late, even though I do have my phone on in case of emergencies. It was a female friend from my hometown. She told me that Gary was at the center of a court case, and he'd just been found guilty of murdering his then-girlfriend. He was sentenced to life in prison, although he apparently ended up hanging himself in the prison cell. I did feel bad for Gary's parents, but to be honest, I felt no sympathy for Gary himself. He had harassed me throughout high school. He even killed someone. As I said before, life is very uncertain, but as terrible as it sounds, I'm glad Gary will never bother me or anyone ever again. I grew up dirt poor in western South Dakota. The county I lived in was larger than Delaware, with a population of about 30,000 people. When I was bored, which was quite frequently, I'd go to the library in town, population 530. I'd pick a random book and start reading. One of the books I read was a history of the area, and one of the stories dealt with my stepfather's father's property. In that, his father had annexed some property in the 30s, during the Dust Bowl. My grandmother was kind of well off, but easily the most evil person I've ever met. Curious, I asked her about my late step-great-grandfather's annexation about a week or two later. The Millers was how she answered. No other explanation. It took me asking aunts and uncles, but the story went that during one of the particularly horrid dust storms, a family called the Millers had abandoned their property, just left the place and went to greener pastures in California. I asked around where this supposed property used to be. They mentioned it was on the southeast side, by some mini Badlands areas we called the Breaks. When I asked if the house and everything was still there, they said no, and that it was a waste of time. I was a curious little shit, though, and my favorite topics were history and archaeology. So, one afternoon, I went to where I thought they were talking about. A bit of a rise in the middle of otherwise completely uninteresting plains. There was nothing there. A couple of more weeks went by. I was probably 12 or 11. I forget exactly. I went on a ride down that way again, dirt bike. I found myself in a sort of V between some bricks when I saw what I thought was a weird pyramid of some sort. I went to go check it out. What it actually ended up being was the angle of a roof sticking out of the ground. I went around to the far side of it and saw an attic vent. Being more curious than cautious, I pulled the framing around the vent and opened it up. There was a bunch of dirt blown around, but otherwise the area was mostly intact. Nothing much to it, really. It was an unfinished attic with one of those old-school ladders halfway down and a couple of holes going down to the rooms underneath. I glanced down into one. When my eyes adjusted to the light, I'm fairly sure I saw someone down there lying on the floor. I can't tell you who they were, though, because I was out of there so fucking fast, I outran the photons in the air. I rode back to Grandma's house, but there was no way on the planet I was telling that woman I'd gone there. 
I waited for a week and told my cousin Brad instead. Brad was and is slightly more intelligent than a piece of driftwood. He called BS and wanted to see himself. I was having none of this, but told him I'd take him there anyway. I wasn't going to be a chicken. When I got to where I had been before, where I damn well know I was, there wasn't a house or a roof either. You could see my dirt bike tracks and footprints all around, but it looked like I'd just walked around nothing for a while in the alkali dirt. Brad gave me a bunch of crap about it, went down and told my other cousins I'd tried to fool him. Even a couple of my aunts found out and gave me shit for it too. I swear it happened though. There's been a whole lot in my life I may have embellished to make more interesting, but this happened just the way I typed it, and it still messes with me to this very day. Let me give you some background on the situation. My name is John, and I was 16 at the time of this event, in the middle of my junior year. I'm of Asian descent and I'm nearsighted as well, which means I can't see very far away. No more than a couple inches away from my face, really. It all started when I was in my homeroom. I'll call my teacher Mrs. H. Now, Mrs. H was a young woman in her 30s, but looked much older than she was. She taught history and I have her second period. First period had just ended and I was just getting into class. As I was walking over to my seat, I saw a skinny black-haired kid sitting there already. Are you the new kid? I asked. Yeah, name's Kyle. Cool, my name's John. I don't want to be rude, but you're in my seat right now. Could you please move over? He gave me the face a child would make when you don't give them what they want. He sat up and sat in the seat right behind me. He reeked like someone who hadn't had a shower in quite a long time. I took a seat and the class began. Mrs. H explained that there was a project we had to do on famous landmarks. This was a partner project. Lucky me, I was paired with Kyle. I thought not only was this going to get me a bad grade, but it meant he had to come over to my house too, or I had to go over to his. Obviously, I did not want someone coming over to my house. I didn't wish to go anywhere else, really, for that matter. So I made a stupid decision and decided to give Kyle my phone number instead. Everything was alright for the first couple of days. Nothing really weird beside that look he'd given me a couple of days ago, except for one afternoon, where me and him had just finished up writing. We'd both done two pages each, and were going to pick out the highlights from both of them and combine them together. That was a couple of hours ago. My parents were now out at dinner, and I was home alone playing some computer games. That was when I heard what sounded like glass shattering from the basement, which was quite odd because I was on the second floor. Being the coward I am, I decided to pause my game and just listen, not sure what to expect. I sat there listening for a good five minutes before resuming my game playing. Another minute went by, and I could hear the door to the basement opening. I don't have any pets beside the cat, which was on my bed at the time. I left my computer and turned off the monitor, grabbing my phone to dial 911. This was on a landline installed to my room, which was my dad's office for some time. I quickly told the operator the situation, and she dispatched an officer. I could hear quiet footsteps moving up the stairs. It felt like forever, but was really only three minutes or so, when I heard the sirens approaching. I'd never felt so safe in my life. That was until my door slammed open. I couldn't see much, only a mere silhouette of a figure. The sirens passed by my window and shone enough light for me to see the face of Kyle. He didn't seem to notice me there. He hid in the closet parallel to me. I'd never been so scared in my entire life. His facial expression was the same from when I told him to move out of my seat. In roughly 30 seconds of utter darkness, besides some streetlights glaring in through the window, the door slammed open. A cop rushed in and turned on the light. 
He asked me if I was okay. I screamed my lungs out, trying to explain that he was hiding in the closet, all the while sobbing. The officer opened the closet, and Kyle attacked him immediately. Luckily, he managed to tase Kyle. I asked the cops why they'd arrived so fast when it normally takes them much longer to get there. He told me the operator had heard another phone line click after I hung up. I handed in the project a week later, because I took some time off from school. I stayed at my grandparents' house for a while. Luckily, I got an A, so I never had to meet Kyle again. By the way, I recently noticed that my Facebook has my phone number and address on it. Needless to say, that's probably how he got my address. Without a doubt, I took both off and set my profile to private. If you have a Facebook as well, I advise you strongly to do the same. Working from home during the 2020 pandemic was a real blessing. No getting up two hours early for a commute. No standing next to zombified, angry strangers on the train platform. No being smothered once you're actually inside. No rushing, and most importantly, no late-night train commutes to get back home when you're already exhausted and just want to curl up on the couch with your cat and avoid thinking about life for a while. At least, that was my experience. Unfortunately, all blessings must eventually come to an end, I guess. I work at a marketing office in the heart of New York City, and corporate wanted all available employees to come back to the office as soon as possible. Pretty much immediately once the necessary mandates had all been lifted, which meant all the things I hated would be coming right back, and my cat would be quite lonely to boot. I considered quitting after a lot of soul-searching during the break, but... Fuck it. I still needed the money for my apartment and the little fluff ball living with me. I reluctantly prepared for my first morning commute in many months. It was just as terrible as I remembered, but this time it was also full of other people who also hated a sudden return to the office. The usual assholes shoving their way around the train were multiplied by ten. I just tried to shuffle along with the crowd and get to work unscathed. The work itself wasn't too bad, about the same as doing it from home, with the exception of the boss asking a few of us to work overtime tonight. It was something I could refuse from the comfort of my own home, but his expectant smile said he'd make sure I wouldn't be invited to the company happy hour at the end of the month if I didn't do it. It was a grin as fake as sugar-free syrup, Needless to say, I agreed. I didn't get out until at least 10 at night, meaning the sky was quite dark and I could see my breath in the open air. I hustled to the subway station a block away from my office building and scuttled gratefully down the stairs. It wasn't much warmer than the above ground, but at least it did provide some shelter from the shearing cold. The platform itself was nearly empty, except for a few stragglers like me waiting patiently on the outskirts of the platform. I guess that's one blessing in getting out this late. The train wouldn't be very crowded. When you try not to make eye contact with people waiting for the train, you go into a kind of autopilot trance. I was just thinking about whether my cat at home would be mad about getting his dinner late when I felt someone bump into my shoulder. I kind of absent-mindedly stared into space for a solid minute before breaking out of my trance and turning to face the person who'd bumped into me. I expected an apology or someone talking on their phone oblivious, maybe even an angry huff as they walked past. You know, something normal. Instead, what greeted me was a man half an inch from my face, looking straight into my eyes with the biggest fucking grin I'd ever seen. I almost came out with an, oh, Jesus Christ, but I caught myself at the last minute. I'm sure the man could see the shock on my face, though. In fact, he seemed to be kind of enjoying it, because he blinked and his grin became even wider, if that was possible. Do you need something? I asked him, hoping he'd tell me what he wanted and just fuck off, but instead he kept staring. Whatever, I said to no one, 
and promptly moved to the other end of the platform. No luck, though. This creepy guy followed me, doing a kind of weird side shuffle like you might see in a Looney Tunes cartoon. He bumped up against me again. I had to wonder at this point if he needed help or if he was on drugs or something. Hey, buddy, I tried again, putting my hands up. I'll call someone for you if you need it, but stop following me. My voice kind of wavered, and I hated myself for that. This time, he actually answered me in a surprisingly raspy voice. Tell me where you live. What the fuck? No! I lost all politeness at this point. This was getting really creepy. I couldn't wait for that train to come already. Thankfully, it did. The train pulled to a screeching stop, and I was never more grateful to see it than that moment. I bolted to the open doors without looking back at the smiler to see if he was following me. Maybe a potential mistake on my part, but I didn't really care. I immediately hunkered down into a seat. I watched the passengers getting on after me and scanned the aisles as best I could. I was hoping he didn't or hadn't already gotten on to another door. It looked like I was lucky, but just to make sure, I turned to look out the window towards the platform. He was still out there, smiling. He waved at me as the train started to move. The last image I saw of him was when he turned and walked away, probably to go bother someone else. I didn't know what he wanted, but I have an inkling that it probably was not good. And for those of you wondering, yes, my cat did get his dinner. The things I put up with for that little guy. In 2010, I was driving from New Orleans to Eugene, Oregon. It was just me, 24 and female, and my two-year-old pit bull in a 14-foot U-Haul truck with everything I owned crammed into the back. I had a fancy flip phone and my printout map quest directions as well. I think the first smartphones were actually coming out around that time, but I didn't have one. Cell phone service was also much spottier, and there were long stretches through the desert where you had zero service for hundreds of miles. I was driving a lonely stretch of highway through central Texas when I realized I hadn't seen a town or an exit for a very long time, and my giant U-Haul was really low on the gas. Just when I was starting to freak out and seriously run out, I saw a small town coming up ahead. I pulled into this town, and it was really tiny. I was so worried about other things at the time that I never paid attention to the name of the town, but there were only about six streets in the entire place. I go gas up, and I'm ready to get back on the road. Except for the life of me, I couldn't find my way back to the highway. I circled the town about four times, and started getting really frustrated. This was such a tiny town. How could I not find my way out of here? I could literally see the highway, but I just couldn't get to it. I returned to the gas station to ask for directions. Now, when I got the gas initially, I paid at the pump and never went inside. When I entered for directions, there was a skinny nondescript guy who had black hair hanging down in front of his eyes that looked like it could use a good wash. He was not particularly creepy, but he was a little bit rude. He never really met my eyes. He was just looking down at a magazine. He gave me directions which didn't sound right at all. He was telling me to take a road that would get me to the highway in 17 miles. For a moment, I was dumbfounded. Then I pointed out that I hadn't had to drive that far to get from the highway into town, so why was it so far to get back to it? I could literally see it from the town. He was so casual, almost like I was just an annoyance. I could follow his directions or not. Why should he care? He gave me some explanation about the road curving around that didn't really make sense. He still wouldn't look at me either. Just whatever, I gave you your directions and waved his hand in the direction of the door. When I got to the parking lot, my whole body started trembling violently and my heart started racing, seemingly for no reason. I got into the truck, and as soon as I put the key in the ignition, I burst into tears. 
I had the most terrible feeling that no matter how nonchalant he acted, the man had bad intentions. I didn't know what exactly they were, but I knew right then and there there was no way I was going to follow these directions. Yet this was the only store in this little town, and short of knocking on everyone's doors, there was no one else to ask. I decided I didn't give a shit if this town seemed like something that dropped right out of the twilight zone. I was going to drive around until I found my way out, even if it took all damn night. Right then, a big red beater of a pickup truck, just as much rust as metal, pulled up and disgorged the quintessential Texan man. Huge, husky, and in flannel and work boots. Without even thinking about it, I jumped out of my truck and approached him quickly, yet warily. Looking into his eyes, though, I saw a kind human being, or at least I was hoping I did. I asked him if he could please give me directions back to the highway. I told him I knew it was silly, but I just couldn't seem to find my way back. He looked concerned as I was visibly upset, so he made me laugh and very cheerfully gave me directions. For a hairpin curved turnoff right at the end of a small concrete tunnel I had passed by several times. He said it often confused travelers because it was so hard to see, and that they really needed to put up some signs. With a sinking feeling in my stomach, I asked him how far in miles it was back to the highway. He laughed and gave me a funny look. Miles, miss? I'd say it's a quarter mile at most. You can see the highway from right there. At this point, I couldn't help it. I had to know. What happens if I drive here? I gave him the directions the man in the store had given me. Old Texas looked at me very intently and asked me how I knew about this particular route. It was pretty far out, and usually only locals knew about it, so I told him. He was quiet for a few minutes, then asked what the attendant looked like and if I had a map of the state. Nope, just my map quest which wasn't useful in this situation. He went back to his truck and grabbed a raggedy local map from his glove box. Spreading it out for me, he retraced the route I described. The way the man from the gas station had told me to go led away from town, away from the interstate, and seemingly to the middle of nowhere. Texas told me the road did go about 17 miles, right before it dead-ended in the middle of the desert. I asked him what was out there. He told me it was nothing but some junked cars and a few trailers and mobile homes, all owned by the same family. The family was known locally as troublemakers, meth heads, and alcoholics. These were the nice things townspeople had to say about them. The erstwhile clerk was a part of this family that lived down that road. I'll never forget the look in Texas's eyes as he told me this. He also told me I was smart to listen to my instincts and told me to be careful when traveling out there. I don't know if the man from the gas station wanted what was in the back of my U-Haul or what was in the driver's seat, but thankfully I didn't have to find out. I also learned that sometimes angels look like ruddy-haired Texans with scruffy faces and rusty old pickups. Thank you, random Texan stranger. You really saved my ass and I'll always remember you with tons of love. I used to work at a small subway located in a huge indoor fast food conglomerate plaza that functioned as a rest stop for buses on the highway passing through Connecticut. How it works is that each fast food joint has its own little cubicle inside a large circular building. Honestly, kind of like a mall food court, except it smells more like gasoline than your typical mall would. I saw all kinds of passerby on my shifts. Some just in a rush to catch their bus before it left, and others coming into the station from their cars with all the time in the world. All relatively normal. I'd just make their sandwiches as the faces slipped by, one blending into the rest as I waited for the long night shift to end. The only way some stood out to me on the longer nights was if they had cool makeup, an unusual hairstyle, or were exceptionally patient or nice to my frazzled self. One night though, one of the bust customers stood out to me for all the wrong reasons. It was much busier than usual this night 
and all across the food court, lines were nearly merging into one another, like a huge net made of people. I was doing my best to get all these sandwiches out before the buses left, when suddenly a young woman appeared at the head of my line. She was skinny, pale, and disheveled, and looked as if she didn't know where she was. I couldn't tell if she was in her right mind or extremely tired, so I decided to rush to get her on her way. That was until she whispered in a quiet and timid voice. What state are we in? I didn't know what to say to that. She didn't elaborate any further, so maybe she'd just fallen asleep on her bus and needed someone to tell her where she'd ended up. Uh, we're in Connecticut, ma'am, I said. I thought she'd feel better, but she got this wide look in her eyes. Wait, I was in New York. Her words began to slur. I was afraid she'd stumble and fall when a man slid into line behind her, grabbing her arm. There you are, he said brightly. I've been looking for you. He looked from the half-made sandwich in my hands to her. Then, my probably confused expression, his voice became a little quieter, and he leaned in. I'll pay you for anything she got. Uh, okay, sir, I said hesitantly, bagging up the sandwich and bringing it to the register. The man ushered the young woman along. I noticed that she seemed very jumpy whenever he touched her, still a little loopy as well, and definitely a lot more jittery. She kept making eye contact with me, but didn't seem to be able to form the expressions he wanted to. Weirded out, I got them all paid for and sent them on their way. I took my phone out of my pocket, though, and held it under the desk as they went. When the man wasn't looking, I raised it and snapped a couple of pictures. My gut told me that was the best course of action. Something didn't feel right here. Maybe that woman needed some help. Maybe she was drugged or mentally ill. An even sicker thought entered my mind. Had I just let a human fashioner get away with his victim? I immediately thought back to a safety video we were all shown when the rest stop hired me on. How to spot fashioning victims, and she hit nearly every box. I immediately alerted my manager to the situation, and he called the authorities just as I saw them slipping out the door. I didn't want to cause a scene if I'd been wrong, but I also couldn't just let them go with a good conscience. The police arrived soon after, and luckily pulled over the bus as they were leaving just a mile or two down the highway. The woman was delirious and could hardly speak for herself. The man was extremely cagey. They took him into the station for more questioning and took her to the hospital. Needless to say, they found a cocktail of date beer drugs in her system, and her levels indicated she'd last been dosed soon after she came off my line. He'd probably hidden something in the sandwich she got, which I still feel guilty for just making when the woman was clearly in trouble. I told the authorities everything I could about the man, how domineering he was with her, how scared the woman seemed, how she mentioned New York, and how she didn't seem to know him at all. Turns out she was indeed from New York and had been trafficked all the way to my bus stop for sex. I really hope she recovers soon. I still work at that bus stop in the same subway station, but nowadays, I pay a lot more attention to the customers that come in. You never know when your timely intervention might just help to save someone. So my stepsons are 7 and 10. They play with five other boys in our area who are of similar age and all go to the same school in our neighborhood. Now, there's a police station in our neighborhood, and we live in a city that's large. We feel very safe here. There's almost zero crime in this area, so when they want to go to the park or play with their friends, the husband and I agreed that it's okay. They'll often be gone for hours, going from house to house, swimming, jumping on trampolines, scootering, and skateboarding. Sometimes they all come to my house for my pool. It's a good system. I'm texting with other parents as well, so we have a pretty safe thing going. Our state, however, has been known for human trafficking because we're close enough to the border. It's something to worry about. I bought both of them bright orange ear whistles and tied them to their backpacks. Sometimes they all ride bikes to school together. 
At home, I had them practice blowing into the whistle as hard as they could, so they knew how loud it was and to only use it for emergencies. We also discussed which situations constitute an emergency. Today, on break from school, the kids wanted to do a lemonade stand. Something in my gut told me to say that was not a good idea, even though they had their own little garage sale around Christmas to make money, to buy gifts for everyone. The neighborhood thought it was cute too, and they actually got a ton of donations and made some good money. I didn't have any worries that time. Today was a different feeling though, for whatever reason. As my older stepson was making his signs, I reminded him about interacting with strangers and told him he needed to watch his brother closely. He asked me if he should bring his whistle, and I said that was a great idea. I took it off his backpack and put it around his neck and told him I was going to leave the window open just in case. If they felt scared for any reason, or if something happened, blow the whistle like there was no tomorrow, and I'd run outside. They were right on our street corner of our neighborhood, right where the main street went through, so there were a decent amount of cars going by. An hour or so had gone by, and I was well into a documentary when I heard that whistle blowing as hard as it could. My stomach dropped, and I dashed outside. I saw a flashy red car by them, like a charger, I believe. I was looking and running towards the kids, so I wasn't paying close enough attention to the car. I could immediately see all the kids were still accounted for, but I could also see a man running to get back into his car. My older son told me our younger son, who really liked cars as does his dad, had been approached by the man in the car. He got out and started talking to them, asking them their ages, and invited my younger son to get into his car since he liked cars so much. I'd literally told my older son earlier, don't get into anyone's cars for any reason. When the man said that, he didn't feel safe anymore, so he blew the whistle as hard as he could. I got a good look at the guy at least, but I didn't get his plates. He was getting into his car as I was making sure the kids were accounted for and pounded the fuck out of his hood, asking him why he would even attempt to do this. He just drove away without saying anything. I wasn't thinking clearly and was in a bit of a panic, so I didn't get his plates. They were right there. I'm so pissed at myself for that. The kids were all talking and I went into protective mode and called the police. They searched the entire neighborhood for the car and put out a description of the guy as well. They put out an alert and were taking this very seriously, so that's that at least. I'm thankful for that $10 whistle I ordered on Amazon. Sometimes you just need to know when the shit is about to go down. I'm still so shaken up about this, and all the kids and parents are super concerned. We have a community website, and we posted about our encounter on there for other parents to be aware as well. I don't know for certain the guy was up to no good, but if he wasn't, why would he just take off running like that? I don't know. My view on safety has been wrecked, and it's going to take a while for things to feel okay again, I think. Make sure your kids have plans for emergencies. They have their own intuitions, and they get gut feelings too that they wouldn't ignore. It amazes me sometimes how reliable they can be. Hello, my name is Rowan. I'm 30 years old today. To be exact, I'll be 31 on November 17th. What I'm about to tell you happened 15 years ago on Halloween night. I think that's why I feel the need to write this tonight. Because it happened 15 years ago to the day. First of all, you need to know that my mother had me very young. She was only 16 years old. I never knew my father, and today, honestly, that's not what matters to me the most. I learned to live with him, or rather, without him. After me, my mother had two other children as well two girls with a man she met later at her work. She and him are still together to this day. Their first daughter, Sarah, whom my mother had at 28, and their second daughter, Rachel, who she had at 31. 
At the time of the events taking place, Sarah was four and Rachel had just celebrated her first birthday. As for me, I would have been 16 in two weeks. Remember, this was in 2005. It was Halloween night, like I'd said, and since I was almost 16, I was used to looking after my little sisters for a few hours while our parents went shopping or enjoyed some time together. They decided to do that that evening, to sort of celebrate Halloween between them. So, there I was alone in the house with the girls. It was around 9pm, while I was watching TV, that things started. I heard a noise coming from the garden. At first, given the nature of these noises, I thought it was Sarah playing in her cabin, because yes, she had a cabin out back. You know, one of those little plastic playhouses. That sort of thing. She liked to spend a lot of time there. It was her refuge, really. She had gotten it recently, so usually if you couldn't find her anywhere, you knew that was where she was. I started to think a bit more, though. It was really late at night, at least for her. She must have been in bed since like 8.30 p.m. That was when she went to bed every evening. I went out with the aim of telling her to come inside and go to bed right now, because it was no longer time to play. At first, I didn't realize what was going on. It was only once I was outside that I realized something very important. I'd forgotten that I'd already tucked Sarah in, and the only access to the garden was through the living room, the place where I was since I was watching TV. Furthermore, the door was closed, and it was me who'd opened it. I was 100% certain I'd heard a noise, though, and that it was coming from that cabin out back. That's when I started to really panic, and I got a knot in my stomach. I had a real bad feeling about this. Like an idiot, though, I questioned myself, and thought I'd probably just heard things wrong. Maybe it was the wind that had slammed one of the little shutters or something logical like that. I went inside to continue watching TV quietly. If only I had known. The minutes passed by, but that feeling in my stomach was not getting any better. I was having this doubt. This bad feeling was weighing down on me so much that it started to physically hurt. I even had the impression of becoming feverish. In order to reassure myself, I went to check on my sisters. I started by checking the room of Rachel, my one-year-old sister. This room was on the ground floor like my parents. She was sleeping peacefully and everything seemed to be in place. Everything was going well. There was still a voice in my head though, screaming at me to not leave her alone. I could not take my eyes off her. Until that day, my instincts had never betrayed me, so that's why I grabbed her when I went to check on Sarah as well. I listened in a little closer and gently cradled my baby sister in my arms. Instantly, that woke her up, and she started crying to express her displeasure. But it wasn't that noise that scared me. It was the sound of the footsteps I now heard coming outside through the window. The sound of footsteps moving away, as if the person was running. They continued until I could not hear anything anymore. I was going to check out the window to see if there was indeed anyone or any footprints in the ground just to prove I was not completely crazy. Before I could do so, though, my sister started screaming. While keeping baby Rachel in my arms, I ran up the stairs as quickly as I could. I didn't even need to go up, though, because as soon as I reached the area with the front door, opposite the stairs, I could see it was wide open. There was a man standing right there on the porch, Actually, he had just opened the door to go outside when I came to the hall. I could see he was holding Sarah in his arms. I chased after him, but unfortunately he managed to reach a car parked in front of the house. He jumped into it, with my sister still in his arms. In those moments, I was paralyzed. I was watching Sarah being kidnapped before my very eyes. I wanted to do something. She was calling to me for help. At the same time, I was unable to do anything. I still had Rachel in my arms. I didn't know what to do. Trying to intervene with a one-year-old baby to keep safe and still crying was putting her in danger too. I was torn. 
What should I do? How could I keep both Rachel and Sarah safe? Above all, I was shocked. What was happening right now? My four-year-old little sister was really about to be taken away right in front of my eyes. Unfortunately, those few moments of hesitation were enough. It didn't take much to start a car. I saw them driving away from me. I could still hear her screaming my name. Like an idiot, I was frozen in the middle of the street, doing nothing. When my parents came home, the police who I had called already were already there. The investigation revealed several things. Footprints in the garden, around my little sister's cabin in particular. There was indeed a man who had been outside while I was checking the cabin, and unfortunately, me going outside to check was what allowed him to enter the home. He snuck inside. We learned something else, too. The flower beds at the foot of Rachel's bedroom window had been trampled, because there was someone else outside as well. You should know that the window in this room, like those in the living room, was a sliding window, simply held closed by a system of magnets, and therefore very easy to open, both from the inside and the outside. There had definitely been someone preparing to kidnap Rachel. He'd probably seen me near her and fled. Three days later, two of the men were found, as well as the car. Unfortunately, they probably had accomplices, who were never caught. My sister never came home. It's been 15 years since that night, and I still wonder where she is. If she's even still alive, and what they did to her. My parents and I never talk about it. It's a taboo subject, because even today my mother bursts into tears whenever it's brought up. I always feel like since that day she blames me, and I blame myself too. I stood there frozen watching this man take my sister away. I keep wondering what would have happened if I hadn't taken Rachel with me, or if I'd tried something. Despite everything, if I hadn't hesitated, I wonder if I would have been able to change things. Hello, I wanted to tell you what happened to me literally last night in my building. My name is Manon, and I'm a law student in Montpellier. I live in a student residence, of which there are dozens around this area. The problem is what happened last night, which was pretty damn scary to me. You should know that I live alone on the first floor and that at the end of my corridor, there's a window that only opens from the inside of the building. Around 11.50 or so, I heard someone knocking on my door. At the time, I didn't really react. I just kind of raised my head to look and froze, waiting to see if it was just my imagination or if there really was someone outside at this time of night. It wasn't until I heard the knock four more times repeating that I realized it was very real. I got up and approached my front door. It was at this moment that whoever was outside chose to pound on my door very loudly. Without lying at all, I can honestly say that I've never been shaken so much in my entire life. My first instinct was to call my mother. I called her and explained what was happening. She didn't believe me immediately. It was only when she heard the stranger knocking on my door again through the phone that she really believed this was happening. I remember taking a few steps back quietly, sitting back down on my bed, and waiting with my mother still on the phone. He kept knocking on my door for a solid 20 minutes until he started to take it up a notch. I could now hear scratching against it. I later learned he was marking my door with a knife. It was when I told this to my mother, who was still on the phone, that she told me to quickly hang up and call the police instead. It was 12.20 a.m. when I called them. They asked my address and what was going on. I explained what was happening and in response I just got a noted and then they hung up on me. They didn't send any patrols at all, no teams or anything, not even a single officer. They just left me there with a psycho who was hammering my door with a knife. It was a friend of mine who happened to be a police officer who came on their own to see if everything was okay. He had just finished his shift 
and decided to stop by my building after I called him for help. He didn't arrive at my house until 1.10 a.m. I gave him my keys through the balcony because the door to my building only opened with a magnetic pass. He came to my door and I opened it for him. It was at that moment I noticed the sheer extent of the damage to the outside of my door. Above all, we also noted the fact that whoever had been attacking it had left through the window, which was at the end of the hallway. As I write this story, it's the next day. I went to file a complaint at the police station. They searched a bit and told me that they'd found it was either someone following me or observing me from several weeks and watching me from the outside via my balcony at night. I collapsed in tears when I left the police station. Moral of the story is always be careful. If you come home from college or you're out shopping or anything, and for those of you who have them, always use your peephole on your door. If I had opened the door yesterday to check what was going on, I don't know what might have happened to me. I still don't know who that guy was from last night. My name is Anna, and this is a traumatic episode that happened to me about five years ago. At the time, I was 20 years old, and I was going through a pretty major depressive episode. Being aware of this and knowing I could not handle it on my own, I accepted my psychiatrist's proposal to have me committed to a private psychiatric clinic. This was my first and last experience of this kind. To quickly describe the clinic to you, it was mainly specialized in the management of depressive pathologies. We were not locked up or anything. We could go wherever we wanted in the establishment. We had interesting activities we could attend and daily meetings with our psychologists. In short, there were no madmen or people waiting to stab anyone nearby with a plastic knife or something. I spent three and a half weeks in this clinic and met several people there. There was a group of three guys who were very kind and caring towards me. They always included me in all their discussions. They often warned me about this certain guy, a guy named Axel, who seemed to always be alone and had no friends either. Being naturally curious and easily empathetic, I was interested in his story. I was told he had been there for a month and that he'd not spoken to anyone since. All we know was that he was interned forcibly. We didn't have any more details, but basically if it were up to him he would have never set foot there. He was interned for depression, suicidal ideation, and alcoholism. Interesting character, although very creepy as well. Despite everything, I decided to try and talk to him. At the time, I couldn't bear to see people alone and isolated. He seemed quite interesting. He even made me laugh, and I realized we had the same musical tastes as well. It seemed we had something in common, and naturally we started to hang out together. We formed a bit of a routine. In this routine, in the evening at curfew time around 9pm, he'd walk me back to my room, then go to his for the night. This pattern continued quietly for two weeks, until the infamous evening. He walks me back to my room as usual, then returns to his own just before the nurse's rounds to check if all the patients were in bed. I started to close my eyes, when I heard my bedroom door opening softly. At this point, my back was turned to the door, so it was impossible to see who had opened it from my position. I told myself it must be a nurse who was coming to check if everything was okay and she'd quickly close the door and be on her way. I started to hear though the slightest creaking of the floorboards leading to my bed as if someone was tiptoeing in their socks towards me. My heart started to race but I still felt relatively safe. I was in a medical facility and it was well monitored, surely nothing could happen to me. It really was probably a nurse checking something. At the same time though, I had this voice in the back of my head whispering to me. You're in a psychiatric clinic and someone opens the door to your room in the middle of the night and approaches you without making any noise? Are you sure that's safe? My heart started to speed up. 
I closed my eyes and pretended to sleep. I could hear the sound of heavy breathing right on my neck, almost out of breath. I was scared. Why would a nurse be watching me sleep? I could smell a slight smell of alcohol as well. Why would a nurse smell like alcohol? The sound of that breathing seemed to last forever. I imagined all the possible scenarios going on behind me. This disturbing presence would not go away. That's when I heard my bedroom door close. Except, I hadn't heard the creaking of the floorboards this time, telling me the person watching me sleep was gone. Who had closed the door, and was I really alone in the room right now? I could hear the heavy breathing again, but this time much more muffled, like they were trying to hide their presence. From the way it sounded, I could immediately tell this person was now hiding underneath my bed. Whoever had just closed my room door must have been a nurse who didn't understand why my door was wide open in the middle of the night. My instincts were screaming at me. Whoever was under my bed was certainly up to no good. I was petrified. I decided to do nothing and wait to see if this person would go away on their own. For me, it was inconceivable to put my feet on the ground, knowing they'd just reach out and grab them as soon as I did so. If I screamed, there was no guarantee the nursing staff would hear me and reach me in time. After what seemed like an eternity, I heard the floorboards creak again and the slightest sound of the door opening. I didn't know if I was alone in my room again for sure. For safety reasons, I did not move for the rest of the night, and of course I could not sleep either. I found out the next day that Axel had disappeared from his room in the night and that rounds had been carried out that night to find him. The nurses had searched all the rooms and the garden outside without finding any traces of him. Please note that a private psychiatric clinic is not the same thing as a psychiatric hospital. If patients really want to leave, they can do so at any time. When I explained what had happened to me that night to my therapist, during our daily appointment, she immediately tried to reassure me by telling me it was possible the medications I was taking had made me have a paranoid delusion and there was nothing to fear. I never saw Axel again after, and no one around knew where he had gone. I could never be 100% sure that it was him who came into my room that night, or even that it was the first time he had done so. The only thing I learned later, from an old patient who went to the clinic as well, was that it was not the first time Axel had been interned there. That was something he'd never told me about when we spoke. I left the clinic three days after this episode, and today I'm much better psychologically. I realized later that I had completely repressed what happened that night. The human brain can be quite funny sometimes, eh? I'm Carolyn, and this is my short but somewhat distressing story. Today, I'm 21 years old, but at the time this takes place, I was only 15. I had just finished up middle school, and had to do an extra year to be able to enter high school. This bridging year being quite unusual, the school in which the courses took place was not in the town where I lived. I had to take the train to get to it. It was a direct train and there were three stops. Every 15 minutes there was one. I never really had any problems. One afternoon around 2pm though, I decided to come home early because I was not feeling very well. I called my mother to let her know and went to the station to catch my train. On the platform while I was waiting, I saw a man who seemed to be staring at me. He was a very tall guy. In his 40s, very big, in short, super imposing, I was very petite. This man also seemed to be having a lot of trouble breathing for some reason. He was breathing very heavily. I told myself I was being a little paranoid, and I looked elsewhere. This guy was probably just minding his own business. As immediately as I looked away though, he walked right up to me and said hello. He was polite and hadn't done anything to me so I returned his greeting. I decided to take out my headphones and show him the discussion was over by putting them in. He continued talking though, 
asking me where I was going. I told them the first city that came to my mind, which was obviously not at all where I was going. The train arrived and I decided to get on and go to a car other than the one he was in. After a few minutes of sitting down, I saw him follow after me into my car and sit down right in front of me. I didn't say anything and only looked at the ground. He was staring daggers at me. He was sweating heavily and his breathing was making this terrible hitching noise. I panicked and started to text my mother. She called me and I picked up, acting like everything was fine. She caught on quickly and understood my game. We talked as if she was waiting for me at the station already. My train arrived at my stop. I waited until the last moment to run out, so he didn't try to follow me. I went home terrified. Many days passed by. It was another afternoon where I wasn't feeling very well and decided to go home early. Compared to my class times, this meant I would be taking the train at the same time as the last time, but I wasn't too worried. What were the chances I'd see that strange guy again at the exact same time? Only, who do I see as soon as I arrive? That same man. We did the same routine. I got on the train, I changed cars once he was seated, he tried to follow me, two times in a row. I was terrified. My mother was at work this time, and no one was going to be at home waiting for me. Arriving at a station before mine, I got off the train. He followed me too, but I quickly hopped back on just before the doors closed. He didn't have time to do the same. I never took the train again at that time, and I never saw the man again either. When I was growing up and living in the suburbs, it was always my plan to move into the city when I was old enough. I didn't learn to drive a car and took trains and buses everywhere that I went. There didn't seem much a point to having a car and living in the city to me, when all having a car would do was cost you even more money, difficulty parking, and other such troubles. Things weren't exactly great at home with my parents. They were the sort who said things that made you really believe they wanted their kids out of the house ASAP. They didn't encourage me to go to college or anything like that, and so I did not ever make plans to do so. My life basically had me moving out when I was forced to, and then probably working at a fast food or retail job for a long time. I graduated a semester early, simply because I could. That also meant that since I wasn't going to college, I had to start looking for a new place to live. The semester's finals were over with in January, so that's when I would start looking. I lived outside a large northern city, so the winter was going to be very rough and it was going to be difficult looking for a place to live nearby. I had a job working in the suburbs. I was going to be doing the opposite of what most people did. People tended to live in the suburbs and go to work in the city. However, I had seen the fast food and retail places of the city and I had no desire to work there. I wanted to live there but planned on keeping my job out in the suburbs. Plus, going backward against rush hour on the trains might be a pleasant experience. Well, I immediately found the real difficulty in finding a place to live. I was an 18-year-old high school graduate with no credit history or living references. I didn't want to get a roommate either. I wanted to find a studio apartment and live by myself. This made finding a place even more difficult, but still I kept looking. I had an appointment to look at a studio in a building a little further north than I really wanted to live. The building was also very old and in a not so great part of town, so I wasn't really sure about this place. I told the building manager though that I would think about it and I would get back to him soon. At that point it was very dark outside. It was also very very cold. It had started snowing as I began walking back to the train station. I was trying to save as much money as possible for moving, so I didn't take a bus back to the train station. 
It was a bit of a long walk, but the cold and snow didn't bother me at all. Since I was pretty far north in the city and it was snowing pretty hard outside at this point, there weren't a lot of people around. This was one of the reasons I had considered not wanting to move to this location. I wanted to be in an area with other people around me. I walked under the tunnel just before getting to the train station. I saw there was some guy who was leaning up against the wall under there. When he saw me, I could tell he was going to say something to me. I didn't like when people I don't know try to talk to me on the street. I thought he was going to ask for some change and I would simply give him some. I had my hand in my pocket in order to get some. However, instead, the guy asked me if I wanted to buy some drugs off him. I was caught off guard, needless to say. At the time, I didn't do anything, so I made an awkward comment and turned him down. It seemed like my awkward comment offended him, though. He got really angry at me really fast and started accusing me of disrespecting him. I tried to ignore him and went on my way, but that only seemed to make him even angrier at me. I was beginning to get scared and just wanted to get to the train station. The drug dealer demanded I stop and come back to him. I really thought the best thing I could do was just ignore him, but I was really wrong about that. That only got him even angrier at me. The guy suddenly grabbed me from behind, shocking me, and pushed me up against the wall of the tunnel. It was then I realized he had a knife on him. He held me up against the wall with the knife, talking about how I disrespected him. I denied doing so, telling him that I only wanted to get to my train and get home because it was so cold outside. That didn't seem to convince him, though. He was seriously angry at me. I don't know what I would have done if suddenly three people hadn't turned the corner and were walking under the tunnel now. The drug dealer very quickly hid the knife back in his coat and moved away from me. He actually took the moment to move toward the three men, I assume to try and sell some weed to them or something. I knew I was thrown a lifeline and I took it. I quickly moved out of the tunnel and up the stairs to the train station. I went inside the small station, which had an attendant, so I was relatively sure I would be safe there. When the train eventually came, the drug dealer was on the platform watching me. I thought he was going to get on the train too, but he did not. He watched me as I sat down at the window and showed me his knife as the train sped away. Needless to say, I did not end up taking that apartment. After my parents got divorced, I really disliked being with my dad. My mom and dad still lived in the same neighborhood, although not really close together. I spent most of my time with my mom, although I did have a room at both of their houses. My dad had gotten really depressed after the divorce. He spent a lot of the time that I was with him drinking and not really paying much attention to me. I only spent the occasional weekend over at his place, and only when he really insisted on it. Since I was spending Christmas with my mom, he insisted I spend the weekend before Christmas over at his place. My parents arranged all of that. I was around 10 years old at the time. I think that's important to know if you're to understand some of the decisions I make in this story. It was a pretty lousy day ever since I walked home from school to my dad's place. It had been snowing pretty heavily all day long, so walking to the house caused my feet to get pretty soaked because of the snow. Once I arrived at my dad's place, he had already begun drinking, so the night was not going so great. The only thing I did like was the fact it was snowing outside. I sat at the window drinking hot chocolate and watching the snow fall. My dad drank so much that he eventually fell asleep in his easy chair. It wasn't unusual, but it made the night as bad as any other. I was only 10, and I really didn't know what to be doing in the house basically by myself. It wasn't the first time that I completely had to take care of myself, but I didn't really like it. It seemed like I was wasting my time and my night being here at this house. 
And that's when I got the brilliant idea that I should just walk over to my mom's place. I had made the walk before. It was a bit long and I wasn't supposed to be out so late at night. Maybe my mom might be asleep or out of the house at the moment, but I could not stand spending any more time here with my passed out father. I bundled up as best as I could with what I had on hand, and then I set out into the snow. It had been really snowing hard, and it had been building up on the ground this whole time. That made it a much harder walk out there than it had been walking home from school, but I was determined to make it back to my mom's house. I was moving really slowly through the snow. As I walked by each streetlight, I saw just how hard and heavy it was really falling. A few times, I felt I should turn back around and go back to my dad's house, but I figured it would be fine when I eventually made it home. I had gotten maybe about halfway, when something happened. A door opened suddenly and an older man came out onto his porch. He started talking to me, asking me if I wanted to come into his house and get warm. He said it was way too cold and wet out there, and that if I came into his house, he could call my father for me to come and pick me up. I waved him off, telling him I was fine. I was just trying to get home, and I could make it there all on my own. And that was when he started offering me things like hot chocolate and fudge if I came into the house. He was making me feel uneasy. I was not supposed to talk to adults I didn't know. I wished I could have walked faster, but I would have had to walk in the street for that, and I wasn't allowed to do that either. I wanted to get away from this man. As I tried to go on, I kept note of him from the corner of my eye. The man began coming down his front walk quickly, coming right for me. I didn't think much about it, but I got scared out of my wits when he suddenly grabbed me by the arm. He started trying to pull me toward the front walk, and I knew he was trying to get me into his home. I was terrified, and I struggled my best to get away from him. I began screaming out and yelling at him to let me go, but the guy was dragging me, and he was a lot bigger than me. He was winning easily. There was no doubt he was going to get me inside his house. I got extremely lucky, however, as a snowplow just happened to be coming down the street at the same time. It caught the attention of the man dragging me. I was able to use the icy slickness of the sidewalk to knock him off balance and throw him onto his back. I then jumped over the snowbank separating the sidewalk from the road and in front of that snowplow. The man who grabbed me got up and started running back towards the house. The snowplow stopped and a big man got out of the cab. I ran over to him and told him the man in that house had just tried to abduct me and asked if he could help me out. The driver let me into his truck and used his phone to call the police. He waited in front of the house until they arrived, which took a while. When they arrived, they went and confronted the man in the house. He was arrested for attempting to abduct me. The police then took me to my mom's house. I did get in some trouble for attempting the walk in the first place. Mostly though, my parents were both happy nothing bad happened to me. That was the closest call I ever had in my life. I used to have this friend named Dan who was a lot like me. He was sort of a dark guy. We're all black all the time kept his apartment dark all the time, and tended to spend an awful lot of his time by himself. I don't recall how the two of us actually started talking and eventually became friends. We weren't exactly the most social type. However, it did happen, and we became really good friends. Though we were close in age, Dan hadn't really gone through as much as I had in life. I'd been in many relationships, both good and bad. He had really spent most of his time alone. I seem to remember that maybe we met on a dating site or something like that and just decided to be friends instead. He met someone on the site maybe six months after the two of us became friends, and he became really enamored with them. 
However, his new love was pretty obvious to me as a game player. They lived in different states, first of all. Whenever Dan tried to figure out a way to get them together, it would never work out. It was really just a bunch of drama, and I really couldn't tell Dan what I thought, because I knew he would just get mad at me. Anyhow, the day it all came to a head was on a day where there was a blizzard. My job had shut down pretty early in the afternoon, and cancelled the following day of work as well. There were feet of snowfall expected. I drove through a lot of the heavy falling snow to get home, and was planning on not even stepping foot out the front door for a few days. It was pretty late in the evening, around 11pm or so, when I got a call from Dan. I hadn't heard from him a lot lately, because he was so into his significant other. He seemed distressed on the phone though, and I could barely make out what he was talking about. He kept pleading with me to come over to his place, because he didn't trust himself to be alone. I definitely didn't want to go out into the blizzard, but of course I had no problem doing so for a good friend. It was difficult to get over to Dan's place. The snow was falling even heavier than before, and it was hard to see anything at all. He didn't live very far from me, but it took me nearly until midnight just to get to his place. When I made it there, things began making a lot more sense. The person he was supposedly in love with had been playing some pretty sick games with him, although Dan couldn't quite see it that way at the moment. They were supposed to drive up to see Dan for the weekend, but claimed they had driven halfway and couldn't drive anymore. They went as far as telling him they were going to kill themselves in the car because they were so upset they couldn't finish the trip and come see him. Dan offered to go find them and pick them up, but they eventually hung up and stopped answering him altogether. Dan and I were there, as usual, hanging out in the dark in his apartment. There was an extremely strong negative energy in the air. I was doing all I could as a friend to simply try and console him, despite all the bad mojo he'd surrounded himself in. Eventually, although it was hard, I was able to get him to calm down enough that he dozed off for a while. I was laying in his bed watching over him while he fell asleep. Once that happened, I just kind of laid there in the dark, looking at the snow falling outside. I wasn't the type who could usually fall asleep in anyone else's bed, but I had to be there for my friend. I lay there watching the snow as he slept beside me. All of a sudden though, I thought I heard something in another part of the apartment. I didn't think it was anything at first. However, as I was lying there, several things happened at once that terrified me more than I'd ever been scared before. Suddenly, a light in the hallway outside Dan's bedroom turned on. I immediately looked over from the window. I turned my head just in time to see the shadow of someone walking by the doorway into the living room of the apartment. I'm not sure how long I laid there, frozen in terror. Someone had just broken in, but I couldn't figure out how it had happened with both of us there. I didn't know how to handle the problem either. Dan woke up and was groggy, asking me if I'd turn the light on. I told him no, and that I'd been in the bed the entire time. I thought someone was in the apartment. I was going to go and check it out. As soon as I said that, the light turned off. I'm not sure if it was because everything Dan had been through that night, but he immediately decided to take care of the issue instead. He got up and walked out of the room, turning the hallway light on. He then cautiously walked into the living room, and he was gone for quite a while. I was breathing heavily as I waited for anything to happen next. I expected to hear some sign of a struggle or some kind of violence. I didn't hear anything at all though. It was quite nerve-wracking, the waiting there. Finally, Dan came back to the room. He turned the hallway light off and came into the room and sat down on the bed. After a moment, he told me that not only was no one in the house, the bolt on his door appeared to still be locked. That meant that if someone had been in the apartment, they couldn't have just left because they couldn't lock the bolt once they had done so. I think if Dan hadn't seen the light turn off after he woke up, he might have thought I had turned the light on myself, but he witnessed it turning off, 
and was just as confused as I was. After we allowed ourselves some time to process it, Dan thought his significant other had been playing with him the entire time. He thought the negative energy in his apartment had manifested that night into something supernatural. I don't think I believed that, though. I mean, I clearly saw someone walking into the living room. I was sure someone was in that apartment that night. I wonder if they possibly may have gone out through the balcony somehow. We didn't find any footprints or anything in the snow there, so neither of us had any real idea of what we witnessed that night. Whatever it was, though, it was incredibly scary for both of us. I was backpacking in Colorado years ago, near Crested Butte. It was late June, but was unusually cold. One afternoon, it clouded over, like there was going to be a big storm coming soon. And sure enough, there was. A thunder snowstorm. Anyway, one evening, it was getting towards dark, and I found an open cabin. Nothing was in it, really just some bunks that were built into the walls. No other furniture or signs of occupation at all. I set up my tent nearby and waited to see if anyone came to stay inside. By dark, it was still empty though. There were no roads to reach this area either, so I assumed it was going to be vacant for the night. I put my sleeping bag down inside the bunk and tried to get to sleep. I should mention at this point there was a gravel path outside. Just as I was dozing off, I started to hear footsteps on the path. I sat up and turned on my flashlight. Hello? The footsteps stopped immediately. I got up and looked around outside, but I didn't see anyone there. I went back to my bedding, thinking I'd just mistaken the noise. Some minutes later though, I started to hear those footsteps again. Now I was really starting to freak out. I went out again, this time with my knife sheath out and in my hand. Again, there was nothing. I was shitting bricks at this point, but I went back to the bed since I didn't find anything. The next time I heard it, it sounded like it was inside. I frantically shot my flashlight in the direction of the noises, just in time to see the biggest fucking rat I'd ever seen. Bigger than my hand, probably. It darted away. I walked over with the flashlight to see where it had gone through. There was a hole in the wall that I discovered was insulated with styrofoam. This big-ass rat had eaten a hole through the entire wall. There were teeth marks all over it. The rat chewing through the building was what had been making that noise. I thought for sure I'd stumbled into some crazy lone wolf's place or something. When I was around 8 or 9 years old, my parents left the house and left me with my sickly grandma. She was asleep at the moment because of a high fever, so I took the $5 that my dad had left for me to go and buy some sweets. I went to the shop close by that was literally right in front of my house and not even a few minutes walk away. As a dumbass kid though, I left the door not locked and that was a big mistake. When I opened the door as I got back, I saw shoes in the middle of the hallway that hadn't been there when I left. Instantly, I knew that something was off here. I silently opened the kitchen door and was shitting my pants that someone might be there in the kitchen. I looked behind the fridge first because I remembered hiding behind it whenever I was playing with my siblings. There was no one back there, so I felt much calmer now. I grabbed my candies and yogurt and grabbed out a spoon from my drawer. Then I opened my parents' bedroom because I could only access my own room by going through theirs. I froze the moment I did so though, because I could clearly see a man's head hiding behind the sofa. Of course he'd seen me coming. I cried and ran to my grandma to tell her everything, and she immediately thought that I was lying. I started crying and saying I didn't want to die. My grandma finally said she would check it out, but I screamed for her not to. 
There was no way she would be able to do anything about this. My granny took her cell phone and called 997. I live in Poland, so the police number is different than in America. I told them everything, and they told us to go to a safe place. My granny locked up the door with her keys, which was a good move. We then slipped out and went to our neighbor. She was terrified and said we could stay the whole day until they caught him if we needed to. The police came after 15 minutes, though. We heard yelling and a struggle. Then they caught him. He looked very off, like he was on something as they were dragging him out. Luckily, he didn't steal anything or hurt anyone. He was just on drugs. We could safely come back home after. It was a good ending with nobody getting hurt, and a lesson for me to lock the door every time. To this day, I always check eight times, especially if I'm not sure that I've actually locked it. My parents bought a house in a poor neighborhood that was south of Washington State. When we first moved in, me and my family introduced ourselves to the neighbors. They lived about two houses down. The mom established a friendship with my own mother, and they became very close friends. They were both moms, and they connected with very similar interests in art and various other things. That neighbor's name was Heather and Heather had two kids. At the time, they were both in high school. Their names were Sierra and Jordan. My mom wanted me to meet up with them, since my parents were looking around for a babysitter, and she wanted it to be someone she could trust, since the area was not the greatest environment for kids. After spending some time with Jordan and Sierra, I got to know them a little, and frankly, I quite enjoyed their company. They watched over me as babysitters, and hanging around them made me feel much more superior than the average five-year-old. Jordan was a rebel-like teen who would constantly get in trouble at school. My mother was not a huge fan of Jordan constantly getting in trouble, so eventually my mom stopped having him come over. Sierra was a very kind and courteous person and began babysitting me all by herself. She was a freshman in high school and needed the money. She became my childhood babysitter. She had no history of being in trouble at school or at home or of doing anything bad, so my mother gladly let her babysit me all the time. Sierra would play board games with me, cook my favorite macaroni and cheese, and I eventually became very close with her within a short span of time. My parents at the time had full-time jobs, so they started to ask Sierra to babysit me more and more, and in return she would get paid even more as well. Needless to say, she readily took up the offer, and I spent more time with her every day. I began to think of Sierra as one of my best friends at the time. She really did have a huge impact on my life. She also began working with my mom as a house cleaner. Everything was going great for me and my family overall. A couple of years go by and I was just beginning elementary school and going into the first grade. My parents began picking me up from school and I had less time for a babysitter. I became somewhat distant from Sierra as she had become a junior and was now pregnant. She would still sometimes come over to the house and babysit me and help my mother with a few chores around the house, but she became much more mature and would not talk to me as much as she used to. Her mother Heather had a severe medical condition, which caused her to have constant and very painful headaches that she would experience for days at a time. Heather became a recluse, staying inside of her house with Jordan and Sierra. Sierra's demeanor began to change as her mother's condition began to worsen. That was understandable at the time, since her mother was going through a very rough thing. She began displaying an odd change in behavior, though, and started getting into a lot of trouble, especially at school. I'm not entirely sure what exactly for, but it started to really put a strain on Heather and Sierra's relationship, they began to verbally fight with each other almost every day. We could hear Sierra screaming at her from their house and flipping out on her for very insignificant reasons. 
My mother caught wind of these altercations and told Sierra that she couldn't babysit me anymore. She could still help her out with chores when I wasn't there, though. One day, Sierra was helping my mom clean out the basement when she asked if she could use our bathroom. She came back down to the basement five minutes later and finished cleaning. Later that day, my mom had to use the restroom. When she walked in, she saw what looked like a diary on the bathroom sink. My mom didn't recognize it, and with curiosity, she opened the book to see what this was. What she found inside was absolutely terrifying. My mother found sections of the diary which graphically talked about mere solemnation. My mom never got into the specifics of what was inside, and she still doesn't like talking about it to this day. She found Sierra's name on the back of the diary, and immediately called Heather and confronted her about this. Heather stated that Sierra had taken notes from one of her books and was writing them down in her diary. She acted like Sierra did this all the time and it was no big deal. My mother then told Heather that Sierra was not allowed back in the house and she wasn't going to be working with her anymore either. She purposely left that diary there, but for what reason I honestly don't know. Sierra began to claim that my neighbor Rodney had essayed her. Everybody in the neighborhood became skeptical of her claim, though, due to her troubled behavior and never having had much interaction with him ever. Sierra never called the police, Rodney was never questioned about the accusations, and Heather's medical condition worsened. As a result, she died while Sierra and Jordan were both in their senior year of high school. Sierra dropped out of high school and claimed she would be moving to Arizona with her then-boyfriend, she ended up moving out and going to Arizona, while Jordan moved in with his dad. When they left, nobody thought they would ever hear from Sierra again, since she had moved on with her life. A few years went by and I didn't hear anything from either of them. Frankly, I kind of forgot about them over the years, honestly. One day, my parents talked to John, a neighbor who lived across the street, and he asked if they remembered Sierra, if they'd heard from her ever since she left. My parents said they hadn't heard anything since she'd moved. John said he'd recently seen her on the news. She had been arrested for abusing her child in Arizona. The police arrived at her home after she dialed 911 and found her daughter deceased. She had been collecting welfare and living in a trailer with her two children. Those kids were severely neglected and suffered from malnutrition. She wouldn't give the children anything to eat or drink. There wasn't any air conditioning in the trailer either, and Sierra would just leave them there for extended periods of time to go to a friend's house or her boyfriend's house. She ended up going to trial in court for child neglect and killing her own daughter, and now is serving a 16-year prison sentence. I still can't believe to this day that someone my family trusted me with and was a best friend of mine for the majority of my childhood years could possibly do something this cruel and inhumane. I hope that she never has another child in her life and never gets another dollar from welfare. My high school friends and I made a pact our senior year to go urban exploring every weekend before graduation. Our ultimate goal was to hit every cool abandoned spot in town before we all headed off on our different ways to different colleges. We'd take Tim's car and Jared would be our navigator. It was up to me to find us the gems of the operation, the destinations themselves. I stayed up late scouring the internet for any place that was little known or run down. Anything such as abandoned restaurants, houses, parks, even a radio station that ran out of business, things like that. After school, I would also look through the history books to find even more places that were not online or were completely forgotten by the public. There were quite a few hidden gems in there, too. We couldn't get much exploring done during the week, though, so we confined most of them to the weekends and school breaks. We actually got a lot of ground and always brought some weed to enjoy the trip a bit more if the spot we found was not as cool as we thought it would be. 
We also always brought a camera courtesy of Jared, so we wouldn't miss any of the moments even while stoned. We stored the developed photos between the three of us and looked back on our journey every once in a while. Some of them I even still have. It was one of these places that I want to talk to you about, but not for any cool reason or fond memory to look back on. It was the day Jared almost lost his foot and maybe even his life. We decided to go to this abandoned super mall next to the highway leading out of town. Apparently, the mall hadn't been making enough money for the owners to consider it a profit, but instead of tearing it down or converting it into something else, they just left it there to decay and become infested by pests, food and all. It was a bit of a drive out there too, and we didn't really know where we were going. Google Maps had removed the street address long ago. After some detours, we managed to pull into the lot though, the parking lot was massive, yet completely empty, the biggest stretch of black asphalt I'd ever seen. It was just getting dark, so the parking lights were just blinking on. They seemed to coat everything we could see in a blue fluorescent glow. I'm not going to lie, it was pretty freaky at first, but in a good kind of way. Jared took a few pictures of us under the lights as well as the general ambiance, before we headed to the dark mass of shops in front of us. The automatic doors at the entrance were blocked off by security bars, so we found a fire exit. Ever the brave one of the group, Tim swiftly opened the door. No alarm sounded or lights flashed either. It was just a pitch black opening. The air was foul smelling and stagnant, as if it had been festering in there like a smoke cloud. Spoiler alert, it probably was, and we were going to make it even worse with our own smoking. Fuck, man, Jared said, fiddling with his camera. I guess I better turn on the flash. The camera clicked and the white light flashed through the opening for a minute. There was a normal-looking stairwell and interior door off to the side, so we pressed onward. After we passed through the fire exit door, the space opened up to a large cavernous area, devoid of any movement. The linoleum floor was covered in a layer of dust, and whatever fluorescent light that still worked in there somehow produced a sickly pale sheen that made everything look almost slimy. There were two non-functional escalators leading to a top balcony, with even more shops inside smothered in darkness. The only word that came to mind for all three of us was, Whoa! Jared, as always, snapped a few pictures as we walked around the main lobby. Tim immediately got each of us a blunt. Let me tell you, the smell of pot mixing with that stale air was not a pleasant one to say the least. Still though, we soldiered on, laughing and egging each other on as the night went forward. Eventually, Jared decided he wanted to get pictures from the top balcony, so up the escalator he went. I remember hearing the click of his camera in the dark and seeing him run from one side to the other, smiling from ear to ear. Tim encouraged him as well. Dude, check the movie theater out. There's gotta be one up there. Jared beamed at the idea and disappeared into the dark space at the back of the balcony. We waited for the excited reply or disappointed echo, but no sounds came. There was just stillness, aside from that growing weed cloud. Silence as well. Then a loud, earth-shattering crash erupted from somewhere deep in the mall. Jared! Tim called out. No response. Hey man, that's not funny! I tried. What was that? There was no response. Tim and I looked at each other and I swear I became sober in about two seconds when Jared's sudden blood-curdling scream burst out of the empty back rooms. We raced up the escalator, nearly tripping on the way, and found there was indeed a small movie theater right at the back of the balcony. Old movie posters littered the walls, and what separated the ticket booth from the theater door was a thick red curtain. We burst through. The theater was dark, with thick layers of dust floating and swirling in the air. I swung my flashlight down the middle row of seats, and there was Jared. He was pinned by a slab of fallen debris on his left leg. He was trying to talk, but all that would come out were garbled words and quiet wheezing. 
He looked terrified. We all were. Long story short, we immediately called 911. An ambulance arrived along with fire rescue and police. They took Jared away before turning to me and Tim for our statements. Since our friend was badly injured and we clearly looked shocked and shaken up, they let us off the hook with a harsh warning and a big fine each. I don't think that was what they were supposed to do in cases of trespassing like this, but Tim and I were very grateful. We promised we would never come back here again. Jared's foot was badly injured, almost completely crushed from the force, but thankfully doctors were able to get it working and rehabilitate him eventually. He still has to walk with assistance sometimes, but for the most part he's doing okay. Be careful out there. Accidents could be waiting around any corner. When I was younger, I used to think I was having dreams of an old woman in a blue dress with cat-eyed glasses sitting at the end of my bed and singing a song to me. She would always sing the same song and then leave soon after. One night, I followed her into my brother's room. He's younger than me and was around five. Instead of singing to him, though, he woke up and they began talking. After 20 minutes, my mother came in and asked what we were doing. My brother told her, I'm just talking to the lady in the blue dress. She made us go back to bed. I woke up later, still thinking that it had all been a dream. My mom told me the next morning, though, that she didn't want us sneaking out of bed anymore in the middle of the night to go play around in random places. I asked her what she was talking about, and she gave me her version of what she saw the night before. To this day, I believe that was real, though. Every night, that old woman would sing to me. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. She stopped doing that to me soon after, though people in my family would still catch my brother going out and speaking to nothing in the night on numerous occasions. A while later, an aunt came to visit from down south, and refused to come into our house after seeing an old woman in cat glasses standing in the upstairs window. She came in asking who that was upstairs and freaked out when my mother told her no one was supposed to be there. She even let her search the house, but we never found any trace of the old woman. When I was around eight or nine, my family and my parents' friends, along with their kids, had a picnic at a park. My friend John and I were running around as kids do, playing tag together. He was older, around 11 at the time. At one point, somehow we got separated. I was clearly lost in this park and I couldn't even find my friend, much less my own parents. That's when a random woman approached me. She was rather tall, had long black curly hair, was fair-skinned and wore thick-rimmed glasses. She must have been in her mid-thirties or so. She looked very much like any number of my parents' friends. Initially, the woman simply asked me if I was lost. I nodded sheepishly. She then held out her hand and said she could take me back to my mom. I told her, it's okay, my friend John will find me. She then asked me this. Don't you remember me? I'm a friend of your mother's. Come on, I'll take you back to her. Again, I repeated what I'd said before, and that's when she said the creepiest words a stranger had ever told me. Did you know you have the most beautiful eyes? Even to an eight or nine year old, I knew this woman was not behaving normally. Sure, I was a really cute kid with big brown eyes and jet black hair, but that's simply not something a stranger who literally just approached me right now should be saying out of nowhere. Just as she reached out her hand and told me we were going to find my mom together, my friend John spontaneously appeared out of nowhere. He looked quite winded. Where did you go? He asked. The woman looked a little bit flustered. Who's this? I'm a friend of his mother's, she replied smiling. Come on, let's go find her. Sorry, we're playing a game. Gotta go. 
John grabbed me by the wrist and yanked me away, and we ran off together. Flash forward to a month or so later, I'm going to the mall with my mom one afternoon. As we're walking around, I suddenly notice the same woman from the park walking towards us. The same long, curly black hair, fair skin, and thick-rimmed glasses. My mother would always stop and talk if she noticed a friend passing by, and yet this same woman who was clearly walking towards us, who was obviously within my mom's eyesight, this same woman who kept insisting she was a friend of my mother's and that we should go find her together, seemed to be a complete stranger in my mother's eyes. As this woman kept approaching and walking towards us, I remember everything as if in slow motion. She noticed me noticing her. She recognized the fact that I recognized her. And in that very precise moment as we walked right past each other, I looked up and she smiled down at me with the most devilish smile on her face. Back in the spring of 1999, I was living in a loft apartment in Boulder, Colorado. The ceiling above my kitchen table leaked whenever it rained, and the window air conditioning unit was a lot louder than even a freight train. Otherwise, it was pretty acceptable, though. It was cozy with a great view of the Rocky Mountains. At the time, I was writing articles for a paper. After I had finished working my shift at the hardware store, I would spend about three hours writing and editing my column before bed. Because of this, I normally wouldn't get to sleep until one or two in the morning. Directly across the hall from me was a second loft apartment, which had been empty for a few years before a middle-aged woman and her cats eventually moved in. They were the only two apartments on the second floor of the building. Our doors didn't have numbers or indicators such as apartment A or B to distinguish the two separate residences, though. I had a P.O. box, and I'd never received any mail at home anyway, so that didn't bother me too much. It did cause some confusion, though that I believe nearly resulted in my death. One evening, I was typing away on my computer while listening to soft classical music on the radio. When I got up to refill my glass of wine as I walked past my front door, I don't know why, but I got a completely random impulse that I needed to look out the peephole right now. I don't know exactly what I expected to see. It was just after one in the morning after all. But sometimes you just need that peace of mind, which is exactly what I didn't get. Standing outside my neighbor's door, directly across from me, was a short, heavy-set bald man with gloves on his hands and no shoes. I remember spotting his gray socks against the dark wooden color of the floorboards. He wore a dark green windbreaker and jeans and appeared to be testing the knob of my neighbor's door. I remember the sensation of my heart skipping a beat. I had no idea who this man was. I'd never seen him before in the building, but it was his actions more than his appearance that made me uneasy. It was clear he was trying to be very stealthy. He had no keys, but was turning the knob back and forth to see if it was unlocked. I stared at him suspiciously for perhaps 30 to 40 seconds. I was concentrating very hard on keeping quiet, aware that if he got the door open, I may have to run and find my phone to call 911. After another few moments, he released her knob and bent down to open a gym bag by his feet that I hadn't noticed before. I caught a side view of his face. He looked older than I'd initially expected. Suddenly, noticing his face made me nervous for some reason. I began to feel my palms starting to sweat, realizing I still had my glass in one hand. I took a careful step away from the door and set it down on the table. I returned with both hands carefully pressed against the wood, as if making to reinforce it or something. I peered out through the peephole again. My blood froze. The man was looking directly at my door now, standing completely still. There was a look of suspicion in his dark eyes, and a crowbar clutched in his left hand. My heart began pounding loud in my ears. I was convinced that somehow this stranger could hear it. 
The kind of peephole the door had didn't really work only one way like most of them do. Nowadays, there's a kind of frosted glass on the outside to blur the view of whoever is looking in. Inside, all the lights in my apartment were out, except for my desk lamp. When I had stepped away from the door, he had seen the lamp shining through the peephole. When I'd stepped back, he'd noticed the small pinprick of light vanishing. I felt sweat begin to form on the back of my neck as the man took two steps forward and jiggled my own doorknob. Thankfully, it was securely locked. I forced myself to stay put, worried that if he made to break in, even with my full weight on the door, I would not be able to prevent him from doing so. The man jiggled the knob twice more. I was terrified by the fact that we were so close together. Had the door not been there, he would have been able to feel my breath on his skin. I watched as the man again looked up at the peephole. I remember his blue eyes feeling cold, savage, and malicious. I knew he intended to cause me or my neighbor hard, and that's when the unthinkable happened. He knocked softly three times on my door. I heard him whisper through it. Open up. There was no way he could have known for sure I was there. I imagined he was trying to get a reaction in case someone was standing there, but I was legitimately too terrified to move or speak. In fact, I was barely even breathing. It was clear to me that's what he was doing, because if I had been across the room at my computer, there was no way I would have heard that knock. It was a direct threat to whoever was close enough to hear it. The man stood there for another ten seconds, then grabbed his bag and headed back down the stairs, barely making any noise on the wood thanks to him not wearing shoes. I remember being too afraid to turn my back on the door. I was terrified he was bluffing and he would come back upstairs at any moment. I made myself count to twenty, then I took a deep breath and walked across the room to my desk. I picked up my Nokia cell phone and called the police, whispering the entire time. I informed the operator that there was a suspicious man right outside my apartment door, but I had barely spoken for a full minute when she informed me that a squad car was already en route to that address. I happened to glance out the window and noticed the bald man was standing on the sidewalk beneath me. When he saw me peeking, he waved a hand up at me, then disappeared across the street into an alleyway. I nearly choked on my breath and told the operator exactly where the man had gone. When the police arrived an agonizingly slow few minutes later, they searched the alleyway before coming up to interview me and my neighbor. She had called the police a few minutes before I had because she had seen the shadows of feet coming from under her door in her dark apartment. It was revealed that she was in the witness protection program and before the morning came, she and her cats were taken away by two men. I never saw her again. I went to the station the following day and provided a description of the man to a sketch artist. To this day, I'm not positive that this stranger was specifically looking for my neighbor, but if I had to guess, I would say it wasn't just a burglar looking to rob one of us. My theory is that because there were no numbers on the doors, he wasn't sure which apartment was hers and therefore had to test both of them when he wasn't sure which apartment to break into. He decided to play it safe and leave once he knew I was there. To the best of my knowledge, they never caught him. I have nothing but my own personal suspicions to go off of, but I suspect my neighbor may have had something to do with the ongoing trial of Whitey Bulger and the Winter Hill Gang. When she had spoken to the police, I noticed her distinct Boston accent, and a year later it was all over the papers how he and his gang member associates were being charged with multiple murders and colluding with a crooked FBI agent. The following day, I added three more locks to my door. I never saw that man again or anyone else suspicious outside my door. I lived there for another four years, and that second apartment was never rented out again. This past August, I picked up a lot of side jobs house-sitting while working at a ranch that gave horseback riding lessons. The families were all very nice, and it paid well, too. This past November, I was house-sitting for a family 
and watching their golden retriever named Maggie while they were on vacation. They lived in a very nice neighborhood, on the outskirts of a small town. The house was at the far end, and thick trees flanked the backyard. A dirt road ran behind the trees. I accidentally went down that road the first time I tried to find the house, but there wasn't much back there. Just an abandoned home with lots of deer in the front yard and a small run-down ranch house. On the first night, everything was great, but the second night, not so much. I had this weird feeling a few hours before I went to bed, but I initially wrote it off as spending too much time reading creepy stories online. I simply made sure all the doors were locked and the blinds were closed. Then I went to bed just after midnight. As I fell asleep, though, I couldn't shake this uneasy feeling. Maggie would usually sleep with me, but that night she just followed me up the stairs into the bedroom, then sulked back downstairs. At 2.26 a.m., Maggie woke me up by standing next to the bed and whining. I'd just let her out before I went to bed, and I was pretty sure she didn't have to go to the bathroom. I rolled over and hoped she would stop, but she didn't. I gave in soon enough, and as I climbed out of bed, I realized the house was freezing cold for some reason. I followed Maggie downstairs to the kitchen. All the doors to this house were kind of weird. You couldn't open any of them from the inside or outside without a key. Not to mention these were very heavy doors, not the kind that just get blown open by the wind. The only thing that eased my mind was that Maggie didn't seem ready to kill an intruder. She'd usually bark at any strangers. I did a quick look around, but I was too scared to do anything more. Nothing seemed to be out of place. The owners often left credit and debit cards as well as wads of cash lying on the counters, and it was all there if anyone was going to steal something. It was right next to the door, too, so it was easy pickings but nothing was missing. I tried to brush this all off. I went back to bed. Maggie still didn't want to sleep with me, though, and went back downstairs. Less than an hour later, she woke me up again. This time, I didn't question her. I crept back down the stairs more cautiously than I had before. The back door was wide open. This time, the key that had been sitting on the kitchen counter was in the lock, Someone had been in the house with me. The police were called. They looked all around the house but found nothing of value lost. Everything was still in place. I was worried about the intentions of whoever broke in. The family was shocked that something like that had happened and have since moved away to a large farm about 30 minutes away. They now have video surveillance as well. I didn't have the best home life growing up. I lived alone in suburbia, with a father who was passed out drunk half the time and emotionally absent, or at work the other half. I'd have to find ways to entertain myself. Don't get me wrong, I had a couple good buddies that I did stuff after school with, but I never really felt comfortable inviting them over to my house to hang out. We always resorted to going over to one of theirs or hanging out at McDonald's or some other place downtown. On days where they were all busy or once it got late though, I'd have to pick up the slack so I wouldn't get bored and go insane. That resulted in a brief hobby of urban exploration. My dad never really set rules or times I had to be home, so I would just go about my business as I pleased, trying to find really cool spots and just seeing what I could find. I could eat up hours away from my depressing home and come away with a really good story, so what was there not to like? My house was also in a prime spot for this sort of thing, sitting at the very edge of a strip of woods. It was what was on the other side of the trees that made my expeditions worthwhile, a strip of unfinished development housing that had been abandoned a decade prior. It was an entire street of unclaimed territory, each one finished to different degrees. Some were nearly done, just needing a coat of paint, 
while others only had their frames and some drywall. I liked the finished houses the best, though. They were so cool to navigate. I would pretend that I had my own place that had more structure to it, no pun intended, picturing how I would decorate and paint everything. No one knows exactly why the project was abandoned. Maybe the area became unfit or the workers weren't paid fairly. I don't know, and I can't really explain it myself. What I can explain, however, is what I found in the houses sometimes. There were all these little trinkets that I assumed were either left by people looking into the homes or squatters that were long gone. Stuff like old newspapers, empty wallets, even a rare piece of jewelry from time to time. I never found their owners, not that I tried really, so I kept anything I could find hidden in my dresser at home. My dad wasn't the type to look into my personal business or anything, so I knew they'd be safe there. I'd say I'd explored roughly 70% of this housing development by 9th grade, so before 10th grade ended, I was determined to map out the rest of it. I decided to start from the part I had never seen before on the east side. When things started to look familiar, I would know I'd succeeded without getting too lost. After making sure my dad was safe on the couch in front of the TV playing football on a loop one night, I headed out. I packed a flashlight and some snacks and texted my buddies so at least someone would know where I was if my dad was too drunk to notice. I wasn't really worried about anything going wrong, though. The first couple houses in this area were just their frames. Faded blue tarp crinkled under my shoes as I moved around. The one notable thing I should mention was when I shined my flashlight up at the rafters, an owl blinked back at me. Probably had a nest up there, too. I thought about going up there to check what was up there, but A, the beams didn't look too stable, and B, I didn't want to mess it up or get angry owl mom claws to the face. I decided to continue on. After updating my buddies about the owl friend, I went out to the street and saw a little path I had never seen before. It was made of padded down dirt and led through a few hedges and down a slope. Intrigued, I didn't hesitate to follow this new path. Maybe this was a new section I just hadn't seen, or an extension of someone's would-be backyard. Either way, I was excited to find out. The path wound up going further down than I expected, and if it weren't for the moon and my flashlight, I would be wandering around a dark expanse without any identifying landmarks. That's when I laid my eyes upon a park. It looked like someone was an aspiring construction worker in their off time. Rusted metal, a broken swing set, a sagging jungle gym. It definitely looked like it got a lot of love in its working days, though, so I can't fault the builder for that. All the faded graffiti scribbled onto the set was pretty awesome, too. I spent a good few minutes going over all the art on the jungle gym, snapping pictures for good measure, before I decided to try the swing set. One swing had broken free from its chain on one side, but the other still looked fine. I took a seat and started swinging. It almost made me feel like a little kid again, back when my dad was far more stable, and we tried to go to parks like this often together. Hello! A voice called out from somewhere behind me. My feet skidded to a stop and I almost stumbled off the swing. The air suddenly felt cold and I could feel goosebumps working their way along my arms. In all my time exploring out here, I'd never encountered another person. Only the things they'd left behind. I whirled around pointing my flashlight in the direction the voice had come from, but nothing was there. I could only hear the rustling of the wind through the trees and grass. That is, until the voice called again this time from the opposite direction. To my horror, it sounded much, much closer. Hello? Are you there? I knew it wouldn't be a good idea to reply, so I kept my mouth shut. I didn't know who this was that was calling me, or what they wanted, but whatever reason they had, it certainly would not be good. I decided now might be best for me to leave, so I booked it. The swing made a ton of noise as I rocketed out, it banged against the metal pole so hard, it sounded like a gunshot. It made my heart jump. 
I don't know if the person was following me, but I didn't want to stop to find out. Through the pounding in my ears, I heard a distinct and angry yell, though. Come back! Play with me! That sent me into even more panic. I tore through the trees separating the lot from my house, not caring how the branches scratched up my face. My phone buzzed constantly in my pocket, my buddies calling to make sure I was okay. I reached my house, and I'd never felt so grateful to see my dad was home, or hearing those stupid football games on repeat blaring from the TV. I raced inside, slammed the kitchen door, and locked it. My dad was startled awake, and only looked at me dazed and confused before going right back to sleep. Long story short, I didn't go back to that unfinished housing development for quite a while after. When I was about seven years old, I was at a friend's birthday party. We'd gone to the local cinema with a group of six kids, my friend, and her mother. I had to use the bathroom during the movie, and I told her mom, assuming she would come with me. Even back then, I knew going to places alone as a kid could be dangerous, but she didn't go with me. I went out to the bathroom alone. I must mention it was a small local cinema which was really old, and most of the time it was completely empty. It wasn't like regular theaters nowadays that always have people bustling about. Anyway, on my way to the bathroom, I saw some guy leaning against the concession counter, seemingly with nothing to do. I thought maybe he was waiting for his kids to come out of the restroom or something. At this place, the bathroom was one small room that was divided into two halves. On one side was two stalls for men, on the other was two stalls for women. I entered the bathroom and sat down to do my business. The guy came in as well about a minute after me. I could see his shadow under the door of the stall I was sitting in. He was walking back and forth outside of it. He shouldn't have been over on the woman's side at all, and no one else was in the restroom with us. I began to panic. I stayed there for a couple of minutes, too scared to leave the stall. Eventually, he did leave, and I decided to go back. When I walked out of the restroom, he was standing there blocking the doorway. He was standing with his arms and legs spread out like he was about to grab me and scoop me up. My heart started racing. He was more than twice my size. I was terrified. Luckily, I thought fast enough to jump through the gap between his legs. I skidded on the carpet and burned my knees. I got up as fast as I could and ran back to the theater my party was in. I wish it had ended there. That night at home, I remember hiding this doll I had. For some reason, I thought the man was still going to come for me, and I wanted to make sure all my stuff was safe. My mom noticed me acting weird and asked me what was wrong. I blurted out that a man had tried to grab me when I was at the cinema. She kind of brushed it off, but I think she was trying to act like nothing was wrong for my sake. I could see in her eyes that she was quite worried. Later, I heard her and my dad talking, and she asked me what the guy looked like. Did he have a black mustache? Did he have messy hair? He did, but I didn't know how she knew those things. It turned out he was at the house earlier that day, replacing the window. He must have overheard me and my mom talking about the party later. I don't know what he was planning on doing if he did manage to grab me. Was he going to kidnap me or do something else? I'm just glad he didn't succeed. I brought it all up with my mom last night and she looked very surprised for a moment. I guess she didn't think I would even remember the incident after all this time. But how could I ever forget? She seemed very uneasy talking about it, but I eventually got it out of her that the guy was never caught. I'll admit that when she said this, I had a moment of sinking feeling in my chest. They never saw or heard from the guy again. She told me they did inform the police, but they assumed he had skipped town after failing to kidnap me out of fear of being identified. I can't help but feel worried though, worried he may have caught another kid, that they may not have been as lucky as I was. 
All I can really hope is that this piece of shit was scared out of attempting this again, and no kids were harmed. I once asked my great uncle what his absolute worst memory was from his youth. He didn't hesitate at all when he told me it was the night he went to see the movie Dirty Harry, starring Clint Eastwood. It was 1971, in a small theater in Wyoming. My great uncle and his best friend had bought tickets for $1.50 each to get in and see the movie. The cinema had a single screen, and they were sitting in the very back row. They intended to smoke cigarettes and didn't want to be caught and thrown out. He recalled there being only about four or five other people in the theater. For those of you who are unaware with the flick, Clint Eastwood played a loose cannon cop who was borderline insane and on the hunt for a serial killer who called himself Scorpio. The plot was heavily inspired by the real-life Zodiac killer. It was mainly that reason the two of them had skipped school to check the movie out. My uncle was big into true crime and unsolved mysteries. He told me that as he was watching the movie, he was being distracted by what smelled like spoiled meat. Even the cigarettes didn't help to hide the scent. Once the movie was over, his friend immediately wanted to leave and escape that putrid smell. But instead, my uncle bent down and started looking underneath the seat set of curiosity. Two rows ahead of him, he noticed what appeared to be some sort of meat patty lying forgotten on the ground. He made his way over to it, confused about how it had been overlooked by the staff. When he reached the correct dial and bent down, he then shot up again just as quickly and started freaking out and cursing in shock. What he'd originally believed to be just a harmless piece of hamburger meat or something was in fact somebody's severed hand. It was a left hand. The flesh was soggy and gray, sitting in a thick stain of blood. A handful of flies were buzzing around it. What was even worse is that three of the fingers were detached and scattered around the floor, not far away. My uncle told me there was only one employee there at the time. He was a very overweight attendant who was sitting up front smoking a cigar. The man didn't even believe him at all until he actually grabbed one of the fingers and wrapped it up in his handkerchief. When the attendant saw it, he grabbed it and headed over to the theater with a dustpan and broom looking more annoyed than alarmed. Another one of the theater patrons noticed what was going on and went across the street to call the police. My uncle's friend didn't wait for the police to arrive. Instead, he ditched on his bike and rode home. My uncle stayed and watched as the police questioned the attendant and the man who had made the call. The attendant denied everything, even after my uncle spoke up and told them where he had found the hand. And the police went inside the theater and apparently saw enough blood on the floor that they took the attendant in for questioning. They never actually interviewed my uncle properly, though. He ended up just riding on his bike home, practically being ignored and forgotten by all the adults in the room. He never found out the exact story behind the severed hand. He suspected the attendant and other members of the staff may have tortured someone in there after hours cutting off their fingers first before removing their entire hand. The theater was shut down several months later and eventually condemned. I asked my uncle why this was his worst memory and not his most exciting. He simply replied because whoever owned that hand was very likely killed and the killers would never be caught or brought to justice. He says he can still remember the smell of the rotting flesh and the sound of the buzzing flies circling around it. I remember seeing this house for the first time. I was seven years old and my parents had just bought their first home. I remember I used to hate living in the cramped, dingy apartment we previously inhabited and opened the door to our new home with wide-eyed wonder. It blew my mind how spacious this house was. I went upstairs to scope out my bedroom 
I was so excited I was getting my own room, and I wouldn't have to share one with my little brother anymore. On my grand tour of my new house, I finally made it down to our basement. The basement was nothing like the rest of the house, though. The upstairs was elegant and classy. The basement was cold, metallic, and sterile. The ceiling was covered in ancient-looking pipes, winding at grotesque angles. The floor was covered in rough cement. I recall taking a look at the stairs for the first time, and being immediately struck with how odd they were. The stairs were surrounded in drywall, which clashed with the rest of the basement. One particular section of the wall was colored differently than the rest as well. It stood out like a sore thumb. I inched closer and felt the texture. It felt very strange. I knocked on it, and a hollow sound echoed in the empty air of the basement. Something about that sound immediately bothered me. As I walked up the stairs, I could hear the same hollowing sound echoing in the emptiness of that basement. As we settled into our new home, I began to get comfortable with my surroundings. The house began to feel more familiar, everywhere that is except for the basement. It just always put me off, and I avoided going down there as best I could. Our family couldn't be any happier though. My loving father and mother doted over me and my little brother. My life was perfect. Then it began though. I would hear these strange noises. When I pointed it out to my parents, they told me it was just the house settling in. One night in particular though, indicated that something was not right. I snuck downstairs to the kitchen for a late night snack. As I closed the refrigerator, I thought I could hear a tapping sound cutting through the silence in the night. I craned my head to see if I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from. Dread began to wash over me as I realized this tapping was coming from the basement. I inched my way over to the basement door. I opened it to see the blackness below. My ears perked up. There it was again, that hollow tapping sound. It was the same kind of sound I'd heard on my initial visit to the basement from hitting that drywall. I turned the lights on so I could go downstairs and investigate the tapping. It continued as I took the first step. Fear overtook me, and I ran back to my room. I hid under my covers until the morning light gave way to a new day. I remember walking down the stairs, being the first one who woke up. I ran to the living room to play some Nintendo. On my way, I passed the door to the basement. I was in a state of near panic when I ran from it the previous night, and I distinctly remembered leaving the door open and not turning off the lights either. I rationalized that maybe my mother or father had gone down there for some reason later. I mentioned this incident to my parents, and they assured me that what I'd heard was the sound of the hot water heater clicking in the night. I knew better, but I welcomed a logical explanation. About a month after the move, my mother asked me to run downstairs and grab a load of socks as our washer and dryer were in the basement. I reluctantly told her I would do it. It was in the middle of the day, and enough time had passed to dull the fear I had felt a week prior. I turned on the lights and ran downstairs, hearing the hollow echo sound with my footsteps. A cold sweat started to form on me. I made my way to the dryer and grabbed a basket. I pulled the socks out hastily and shoved them in. After I shut the door to the dryer, I surveyed my surroundings. The stillness of the basement was so eerie. Then I heard it. A faint, barely audible whisper. At first, I thought it was somebody calling from upstairs. Their voice scarcely making it down to the basement. However, this was not the case. I could hear the sound was coming from the basement itself, specifically from underneath the stairs. I stood frozen with fear. It began to increase in volume, but still remained barely above the threshold of me being able to hear what was being said. It was incomprehensible to my young ears. It stopped just as quickly as it began. I moved towards the stairs, keeping my eyes on the oddly colored portion of the drywall. As I took my first step to escape this ever-growing nightmare, the most profoundly terrifying moment of my life occurred. 
A loud hollow bang shook the stairs, almost knocking me to the ground in surprise. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me, through tears. I was shaking uncontrollably. I told my parents what happened, and they tried their best to calm me down, but nothing they said could ease my mind. I told them in no uncertain terms that I would never go down to the basement again. They must have been convinced by how terrified I was, because they honored my request and never sent me down there again. After another three months in the house, things returned to normalcy for me. Honestly, there was about a two-week period where I was happy again. The last time happiness would exist in my life or my family's for that matter. One moment in particular comes to mind. I remember lifting my little brother above my head lovingly as his pacifier fell out of his mouth and brushed against my nose. I pulled him in for a big hug. I remember how he smelled, that wonderful smell that babies emit, for the last time feeling content. Any semblance of contentment came crashing down from me and my parents the night of July 2nd, 1991. That's the day Jonathan went missing. A ransom note was scrawled in barely legible English and left in his bed, demanding 20000 in cash. It informed my parents that if they contacted the police, they would kill Jonathan. My mother and father took to their room and argued loudly and emotionally over whether or not to call. I listened with tears streaming down my eyes. My mother eventually wore down my father, and the police were called. Seeing as the location of the drop and time were indicated on the note, the police set up a wiretap just in case the kidnapper decided to call. I asked my parents and the police if they had thoroughly searched the house, just in case he was still there. They assured me they had, and Jonathan would be fine after the drop. The seed of an idea was already growing in my mind, though. It would blossom throughout the rest of my life. My parents followed the instructions to a T. They dropped off the money, then waited in the location they were supposed to pick Jonathan up at. He never came. Needless to say, this tore my family apart. As the weeks passed, there was no news about Jonathan. My young, vibrant parents became husks of their former selves. My mother especially blamed herself for getting the police involved and believed that to be the reason Jonathan was not returned. One night, as she was sobbing alone in shambles, clutching a bottle of wine, I finally decided to divulge to her my theory. I told her I thought it was whoever or whatever was under the stairs that had gotten Jonathan. Maybe he was still alive. She slapped me across the face so hard I saw stars. She screamed at me as she told me to stop the childish shit and accept Jonathan was taken out of the house by a demented person and was dead. My childhood died that day. I remember contemplating taking a hammer myself and exposing whatever was under the stairs, but the fear was too overwhelming for me to actually do it. My family moved shortly after the incident. I remember looking to the future with what might resemble optimism, only to have it come crashing down. My parents divorced. The grief was too much to share. Not a year later after that, my mother blushed herself. The guilt must have overwhelmed her. My father did his best to raise me, but Jonathan's shadow always hung over our lives. Twenty years later, I began to think long and hard about my brother's disappearance, how angry it made me. My family had a chance at a normal and fulfilling life, but it was snuffed out in an instant by whoever took him. I wasn't just robbed of a little brother. I was robbed of any chance of happiness as I grew up. I accepted the official story of what happened, but lately curiosity began to get the better of me. I began driving past our old house, seeing that it was currently vacant. An idea began to swirl in my head. I broke into the house bolstered by alcohol. I decided to do it knowing I would likely find nothing under the basement stairs, but hoping this would close a too long chapter in my life and allow me to finally move on. The stairs sounded exactly the same as I remembered they did, a hollow sound pervading the basement. I stared at the spot in the drywall which was still discolored, ominous as ever. I was feeling a courage I hadn't felt in a long time. The moment of truth was upon me. With all the force within me, emboldened by years of pent-up rage, I ran towards the wall shoulder first. 
the drywall came crashing down immediately. I opened my eyes and the bravery immediately turned into horror. I saw bones on the ground. There, I discovered Jonathan's skeleton. I informed the police, but it had been so long they were not able to find any further clues as to what happened, and the case went cold again. This happened when I was 14 years old. I'll never forget it, however, and it still haunts me to this day. Although I lived in town, I had a friend who lived out in the country when I was in school. I'd been over to his house many times, and I always envied him in a way. He lived much farther away from most people, and I thought he probably enjoyed that peace far better. The house that he lived in was pretty great too. His dad is a carpenter, and I guess he had mostly built it himself. It was very amazing for such a small, crude project. It had plenty of rooms and was a lot more modern looking than many of the older townhouses were even. My friend Eric even had a satellite dish. That was a pretty big deal back in the day. It was one of those really big dishes you might see around, not like one of the small direct TV ones that are around now. You could get all sorts of channels from all over the world, which was really cool. Hanging out at Eric's house was always a really fun thing to do. When I was 14 years old, Eric decided to have a sleepover at his house all weekend after school. It was going to be exceptionally fun because his parents were not going to be home all day on Saturday. So the five of us, four friends and Eric, would have the run of the place for the entire day. For a few 14-year-old boys, having a house out in the country all to yourself was definitely something to look forward to. We had a pretty good time on Friday night. We watched movies and had pizza together. We also played some video games. This happened quite a while ago though, back in the original NES days. We didn't have the same access to the games you'd have now. It was exciting for a while. However, by Saturday, when we were left all alone in the house, we were a bit bored and we were itching for something else to do. Eric had a lot of laser tag equipment that we often played with. If you aren't familiar with what that is, it's a game where everyone wears a sensor and carries a little light gun. If you fire the gun in the right spot, it sets off the sensor and that person is out of the game. We played it very often, but a few of us were looking to try something different than what we usually did. All of us visiting thought it would be fun to go out into the woods and do the laser tag like a game of hide and seek. There was so much woods out there that it would be a whole new world to hide in. We could play a game that lasted for hours and hours if we did it right. The only problem was that Eric's parents didn't like he or us heading out into the hills like that. They didn't own that property, although Eric's dad did know who did. First off, going into that wooded area would be trespassing. They were also worried there might be dangerous animals out there, and there was the possibility of getting lost as well. With them being gone all day though, there was no need to worry about getting caught. The parents would not return until the following morning, so as long as no one stepped into a bear trap or got tangled up in barbed wire or something, we figured we would be okay. We had a really fun time out in the woods. We could hang out in a tree to attack each other, hide behind rocks, or even lay on the ground and cover ourselves in leaves for camouflage. Since it was fall, the leaves had been falling pretty heavily, so there was a lot to work with. We kept up playing the game a lot and eventually lost track of time. It didn't matter though because we were having such a great time. It was sometime in the late afternoon that something odd happened though. We were playing around and everyone had been found except for my friend Rodney. Eric was it and we weren't supposed to help him find Rodney. However, after a while of searching for him, we began to think he must have chosen way too good of a hiding place, so all four of us began to openly search for him. 
We tried calling out for him, letting him know that he was safe because he'd found such a good spot. This was a way of trying to entice him to come out of hiding, but it didn't work. We were at first under the impression that Rodney was just trying to milk his good hiding skills for as long as possible. We certainly didn't think that something may have happened to him. However, as we looked around for him more and more, and he didn't run out and yell and surprise us or something, we began to think that something may have happened to him. Maybe he had fallen and broken something or been knocked out somehow. As far as we knew, there could have been dangerous snakes out there and he could have gotten bit. There were just a whole lot of things we didn't know, but we were pretty sure we would be able to find him. All of our confidence went down significantly when we noticed the light was beginning to go away. Eric had never been out in the woods before like this, so we couldn't count on him knowing his way around to help us find Rodney. It was going to be even worse once we didn't have any light. We redoubled our efforts, but began to get very worried about this. We sent Eric back to the house to get some flashlights, while we continued looking. We didn't think about how stupid it was to try splitting up, especially when it began to get dark outside, but we weren't exactly thinking rationally at that point. A friend of ours was literally missing, while we were out doing something we were never supposed to be doing. If we didn't find him, who knows what would happen to the guy? To a lesser extent, we were also pretty worried about what was going to happen to us either way. Eric got back with the flashlights, and we continued to look for Rodney well after the sun went completely down. It was very difficult doing so, of course, without being able to see far ahead of us. It was also scary enough without it being dark, but even more so with it being completely pitch black and being all alone. Every step was terrifying, especially when you consider the imagination of a 14-year-old boy trying to imagine what the different reasons may be that Rodney had disappeared. Suddenly, I heard one of the other guys screaming. I couldn't figure out based off the sound who it was, though. I could tell the direction it was coming from. I began running as fast as I could in that direction. After a while, I was able to hear and eventually see my other friends running towards the scream, too. I figured out it was our buddy Adam who had screamed and was now running towards us. We stopped him because we wanted him to explain to us why he was panicking. He was utterly terrified, however. He didn't want to talk. He just kept wanting to run off towards the house. We couldn't reason with him at all. This boy was seriously scared to death. Eric, I, and the third boy Lonnie agreed to let him go back to the house, and we would continue to look around for Rodney. We kept looking and looking, and I don't really know how long we were out there. However, there had to be a point when we realized things weren't going to be going our way, and we needed to get the adults involved. That's when the three of us gave up our search and headed back to the house. Once we were there, Eric called the police and let them know that Rodney had disappeared several hours ago and we hadn't been able to find him at all. It was only when the police had gotten there that we realized what had scared Adam so bad. He had seen a guy out there in the woods, a huge, scary-looking guy. The guy had rushed towards him when he saw him. Based on Adam's description of the scary man, the police had a pretty good idea of who it was. There was an old man who lived in a shack further up on the hills. He was basically a hermit and didn't have much contact with other people. When Adam saw the guy later, he confirmed it was the man he had seen rushing at him. That was a new for me, Eric, and Lonnie, because after Adam had fled, we had still been out there in the dark with that scary man, but we hadn't seen him at all. There was no doubt in any of our minds he had something to do with Rodney's disappearance. The man was never charged with anything, of course. Rodney was never found either. There was no real evidence he was kidnapped or killed or anything like that. All subsequent searches turned up no evidence. It was eventually decided that Rodney ran away from home, and he used the laser tag game as a way to stage his disappearance. That never sat very well with me, however. I mean, it didn't make sense. He would have had to have decided to run away that day, since we only decided to play the game that day. With no body or anything ever being found, though, it was the only explanation for what could have happened to him.
I really liked going out with my cousins along the creek in order to skip some rocks. The only issue was that we had to walk along the stream for a really long time until we came to the part of the creek that was as wide as a pond. And that was the place where the creek was surrounded by rocks we could use to skip across. It was quite a walk, but we went out and did it all the time. I think we may have been about 12 on this fall day, that we once again decided to go to the creek and skip rocks, or maybe try to find and collect salamanders. The first reason I'll always remember that day is because it felt like the first real day of fall that year. Not only were leaves falling from the trees as if it were raining outside, but it had gotten chilly for the first time that year. I remember being told that we had to put our jackets on if we were going out. The day was going along pretty much like any other day, with us going out to the creek. One of my cousins had brought a jar that he used to try and catch salamanders into. Out of the three of us, he kept falling behind as we walked along the creek. Once we got there, that cousin kept on looking for salamanders, but wasn't having any luck with it. Looking back, I wonder if that might have something to do with the weather, but I can't really say for sure. The other two of us kept finding rocks and skipping them, trying to see who could skip them the farthest. We did that back and forth for a while, nothing really out of the ordinary happening. Eventually though, up ahead of the creek, we saw something we never expected. There was a man of some sorts just walking along the bank. He was on the other side of where we were, and once he noticed us, he started moving even faster. The man looked like some old hillbilly you would see in a movie, and not the sort of person any of us were used to seeing in real life. He was ragged and dirty, and as he got closer, we noticed he had a really scraggly and long, unkempt beard. He was sort of a creepy-looking guy, honestly, but we didn't give that very much mind. The guy walked over to the thinner and shallower part of the creek and crossed over. He was obviously trying to come and get over to us and do something. We were somewhat guarded, but still not worried. And 12-year-old boys often have a whole lot of bravado, and we didn't think we had anything to be scared of. As the guy got closer, though, we realized just how disgusting he really was. He didn't have any teeth and he smelled worse than anything I had ever smelled at that age. All in all, we didn't really know how to react to him, other than being somewhat cautious. The man called out to us, in the scariest old voice I'd ever heard. Hey there, I want to show you something. He kept motioning over to the way he had come from. He tried to convince us to follow him, to see whatever this was, then turned and started walking off. Turning around after noticing that we hadn't followed him, the man looked pretty confused. He stepped back towards us and tried to get us to follow him again. He kept going on and on about having something he really wanted to show us, but we wouldn't get to see it if we didn't hurry up and follow him. That attempt wouldn't last, though. When we didn't react at all, he walked over to my cousin Jimmy. Jimmy was the one who was looking for the salamanders. The man grabbed him by the arm and began to pull him away. He kept going on and on about wanting to show us something, but by that point, there wasn't a whole lot of what he was saying that any of us could make out. Plus, once he had grabbed onto Jimmy, we weren't really paying much attention to what he was saying anymore. We were just worried our cousin was in some trouble now. Jimmy was definitely scared. He began yelling and struggling to get away from this scary guy, However, the guy had a firm grip on him, and he wasn't about to let go. He succeeded in dragging Jimmy a few feet, before either of us were able to have a chance to react. Once we were able to, though, me and my cousin picked up the rocks we had been skipping and started to throw them at the man who had a grip on our cousin. Several of the rocks landed solid hits on him, but he didn't let go until I threw a particularly sharp one just like I was skipping it. It hit the old guy in the forehead, and he fell over and let go of Jimmy. Jimmy ran over to the two of us. The man leapt up, this time sounding very angry. We were able to see his face clearly, and I could tell the rock I had thrown had deeply cut into his face. He was bleeding pretty badly. We could also tell how angry he was because he started screaming at us, then started stumbling towards us. 
He was falling down over and over, though. We didn't need to talk about it any further. The three of us began running as fast as we could, and we didn't look back at all. We didn't want to see how close that scary old guy was to catching us. The scenario was already scary enough thinking about it. We didn't look back before we got to the dirt road that led back to my house, and we didn't see him anywhere. We were honestly so scared that we didn't even tell my parents what had happened. Being young boys, we thought that if we just didn't talk about it, we could make it seem like it never happened. Naive, I know. But no one ever found out what happened, and we never found out what happened to the old guy. I never really felt bad about it either. I mean, if he hadn't taken hold of Jimmy the way he did, I wouldn't have had to throw rocks at him. So, we never blamed anyone but him. Still though, I hope we didn't severely injure the man. The very first time I ever lived out in the country happened when I was 13 years old. My parents were going through a particularly nasty divorce, and they were doing their best to limit my exposure to the whole thing. I suppose that in retrospect, it was the one good thing that came out of the divorce. They were trying to show me love and consideration. So, I went to stay with my aunt out in the country. She was a very nice lady, who was married to a very nice guy. They also had a very nice son, too. I enjoyed being there greatly, even though it was a bit of a culture shock to me. I was so used to living in a suburban area that nothing was like that in the place where they lived. I was used to living somewhere with a whole lot of people constantly around. It was much different than that, though. If you sat down on the porch all day, there might be one or two cars driving down the road you could wave your hands at, and that was about all the people you would ever see. My cousin Brian and I, most of our interaction with other people was us simply interacting with each other. The house that was the closest to my aunt's house was this big Victorian looking one. It was completely out of place with all the other buildings in the area. I suppose that made sense though, as it was supposedly much older. According to Brian and his parents, the house was long abandoned and had been sitting empty as long as they had known about it. It did obviously look like it was abandoned too, and we never saw anyone there. Brian and I used to go out and do some stuff during the day though, and one evening while we were walking home, we walked by that big old house. As we did, we noticed there was smoke coming from the chimney. It seemed really strange to us, and we mentioned it to my aunt and uncle when we got home. They said it wasn't that unusual though. Maybe whoever owned the home came by every now and then and lit the furnace to keep the house from getting too moldy or something like that. I can't remember what their exact reasoning was. The next night, though, we noticed the smoke coming from the chimney again. We thought it was weird that we could see it two nights in a row if what my aunt had suggested was correct. This time, we didn't mention it to her when we got home. The two of us just talked about it amongst ourselves instead. We came up with a lot of silly stories between the two of us as to why it could have been like that, but we didn't take it seriously. We just simply considered it something interesting to talk about. I didn't think about it again until a few days later on, when Brian and I were outside once more. We walked by and noticed the smoke again. We decided that maybe we should go up to the house and check out what this was. This was an odd occurrence, and we hadn't considered it up until that point. There was no vehicle in the driveway that we could see. We wanted to get close enough to the house to figure out what was going on. Brian and I got right up to the porch when we suddenly heard the sounds of a woman screaming. She was screaming out in bloody terror as if she were being murdered in that moment. Brian and I got scared, and we ran off to the road. We then ran home as quickly as possible. And when we got there, we told my uncle what we experienced. He went off to check it out, while my aunt called the police. It was a while before my uncle got back to us, but when he did, he said there was no one there. There was no indication there had been anyone there, much less any evidence of anyone being attacked. And finally, the wood-burning stove was now completely cold, 
and there was no indication it had been used any time recently. There was no physical evidence of all the things Brian and I had witnessed. My aunt and uncle didn't accuse us of lying. They believed that we experienced everything we did. They just assumed there was another explanation, something more supernatural. I don't really believe that, though. We didn't get in trouble for lying, and to this day, Brian and I will both confirm we didn't make any of this up. We saw the smoke rising, and we heard the screaming, too but we could never find any evidence it actually happened. <laughs>